Welcome. Check. Is this uh, turning on? Well, test, test. You gotta be smarter than I am. All right, good evening. Thank you for, uh, for taking time out to come this evening. My name is Paul Damry. I'm the director of Christian Challenge, one of uh, several campus groups who partnered together to bring in Frank Turek, and we're really excited um, to, to have him here. We're glad that you're here, and obviously, um, we have a full house. So um, I just want to, just a quick kind of housekeeping thing. If you're young enough to sit on the floor on the edge, and, and that's okay with you, um, it would be nice maybe if we have some, some people who could volunteer to get up and move to the sides. No pressure from anyone, but just a way, a way for us to help with that. Um, there's some room down the side over here. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think it's going to be a little warm in here tonight. We're, we're going to see what we can do about that, but that just is what it is. So welcome, glad you're here, and with really, without much further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Frank Turek. Come on, man, we're getting started here. All right, let's go back to September 29th, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Monsor is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, Kill the Americans! As Monsor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet. Zumwalt class. This is Monsor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. 
There is no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture, a lot of people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. We know religious people can tend to embellish things. And it's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. How many people in this room have ever seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? Yeah, none of us. Why? Because it doesn't happen. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something that none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually from our TV show, which is on every Wednesday nights on DirecTV channel 378. Uh, it would be 8 p.m. here in the Central Time Zone. How many people have DirecTV? Can I see your hands, please? Direct T V. <laughs> like three of us. Come on, friends don't let friends watch cable. All right, how many people have Roku? Someone have Roku? All right, much more Roku. If you look for NRB TV, that's National Religious Broadcasters, on Roku, at that time, you can also, you can watch it there. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Western Missouri right now. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, if you go to our website right here, crossexamine.org, at that time, you can watch it. We're also on radio every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Here it'd be 9 a.m. Now, I know if you're a college student, you don't, you don't get up until the crack of noon on Saturday, so you're not listening to it then, but that's okay. It's podcasted. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. We actually have two shows, one that drops Friday, it's broadcast Saturday, and one that drops on Tuesday as well. And what we do is we present evidence for Christianity and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. We're going to try and cover these points. Actually, we're probably only going to be able to cover the first two. I'll mention a little bit about three and four, but I want to save more time for questions tonight. But anyway, why are these the four questions? Does truth exist? Why is that important? Well, you hear people saying there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Well, if there's no truth, obviously Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course there's truth. If there wasn't truth, would you, would you even be going to university? I mean, what, what are you here to learn? Truth, right? I mean, if there was no truth, would you ever be able to catch someone in a lie? Lies presuppose truth. Of course there's truth. We're going to talk about that tonight. Second question, does God exist? Tonight, we're going to see three arguments for the existence of God. There are more than three, but these are the three we're going to look at. These arguments are in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. In fact, you can establish that God exists without any reference to any religious work. You realize that people knew there was a God and a moral God before there was any Bible or anything else? You can d demonstrate that. We'll try and do that tonight. Third question, are miracles possible? Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. Yet I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible even atheists are admitting the evidence for and if that miracle has occurred, then other miracles are at least possible. Then the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we can see if we have enough historically reliable evidence contained in the New Testament documents and elsewhere to discover whether one event from the ancient world actually took place. In fact, this event 
is critical to Christianity. If this event happened, Christianity's true. If this event didn't happen, it's false. What's the event? The resurrection, right? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity's true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week because if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith, if you're a Christian, is in vain. This is what the Apostle Paul himself said to the church at Corinth. His first letter, chapter 15, he's saying, look, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, forget about it. It's not true. Why bother? Do you realize Christianity is a religious worldview that you can investigate and discover whether or not it really is true? You don't just have to take someone's word for it. It's not just some philosophy. It's actually based in historical events. And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to start right here with does truth exist? Are you guys ready to go? All right. Now, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. You guys got it right over here. You guys didn't. Because if he said it the way you said it, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle the truth. Here's how he actually said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, you guys over here, let's try this again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, that felt better, didn't it? Didn't you always want to do that in some college class? You can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, if you don't get anything else out of what we talk about here tonight, what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, I think is the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And to show you what a dimwit I was, I was 33 years old, I already had a master's degree, and I did not know what I'm about to tell you now. And you know why I didn't know it? Because I never had a course in logic. How many people in here have had a course in logic? Can I see your hands, please? Raise your hands. See these people with their hands up? These are the homeschoolers. You see them? <laughs> Right here, okay? We don't teach logic in public school. If we taught logic in public school, things would be a lot better. But in public school, instead of teaching kids how to think, we're teaching them what to feel. And that's dangerous, why? Because if you go by your impulses and by your emotions, it's not going to end well for you. Yes, emotion makes life fun, but logic makes life safe. And what we're going to talk about today is a principle of logic that once you understand and can apply it, it's going to help you avoid a lot of pain and suffering. Why? Because there's so many statements in our culture today that are logically false. They're logically self-defeating. They can't be true. But if you don't recognize them as being false, you may start believing them, orient your life according to them, and then one day you're going to smack up against reality and it's going to hurt. So this law is called the law of non-contradiction. It says opposite ideas cannot be both true at the same time and in the same sense. For example, we can't both be at Missouri Western State University and not at Missouri Western State University at the same time and in the same sense, right? We're either here or we're not, not both. Uh, either God exists or he doesn't exist, but not both. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't rise from the dead, but not both. It's one or the other. So what we're going to do is apply that law of non-contradiction to so many statements we hear in our culture today. And the easiest way of showing you this thinking skill is to give you an example of using it. Suppose someone were to say to you the postmodern relativistic claim, there is no truth. What question would you ask this person? Yeah, if some, thank you, homeschoolers. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody says there is no truth, you want to say, hey, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everybody see that this is a self-defeating statement? What's a self-defeating statement? A self-defeating statement violates the law of non-contradiction. A self-defeating statement doesn't meet its own standard. To claim there is no truth is actually a truth claim. If it's true, it's false. You see the problem here? It would be like me saying I can't speak a word in English. If I were to say that, what would you say? Yeah, you're using English to say it. It would be like me saying my parents had no kids that lived. <laughs> or my brother is an only child. Or everything I say is a lie. 
Some of you will get that tomorrow. <laughs> or all generalizations are false. Some of you will never get that one. All right. These are known as self-defeating statements. And here's how you apply the law of non-contradiction. What you do is you turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself and ask, is that true? Now, you can amaze your friends with this. Why? You're not being unkind. You're not making statements. You're asking questions. Someone says there's no truth. You simply ask, is that true? And see what they say. All right? Now, we, we need to do several more of these because so many of them are very prevalent in our culture. How about this one? All truth is relative. If somebody says all truth is relative, if you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask back? Yeah, is that a relative truth? Can everyone see this is an absolute truth claim, claiming all truths are relative? It defeats itself. Now, in our culture, it's more often said or at least hinted at this way. There is indeed truth, only my truth. You know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, you live your truth, I'll live my truth, we'll all get along. It sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? <laughs> There's just one big problem with it. It's logically self-defeating. Why? Because if somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, and you turn the claim on itself, you simply need to ask, is that just your truth or the truth? It, are you claiming, is this statement on the top just your truth? In other words, it's just your personal opinion. Well, if it is, okay, fine. But why should I believe it then? It's just your opinion. But if you're saying this statement up here is the truth, can everyone see that the first half of the statement says there aren't any the truths? That this is a the truth statement claiming there are no such thing as the truth statements. It's logically self-defeating. I know this is unpopular in our culture to say today, but there's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. I mean, if you want to say you have your own truth, you might as well say I have my own math. I mean, imagine if Paul, who just introduced me, said, hey, Frank, can you stay around an extra day tomorrow? I need some help here around campus. we got to clean some things up. If you can stay an extra day, I'll pay you $10 an hour, and you just tell me how many hours you worked, and I'll pay you. Now, actually, Paul would never do this. He doesn't pay that much. Anyway, <laughs> well, suppose I stay here all day tomorrow, and I work a whole day, 15 hours. I come to him. He goes, what do I owe you? I'll say, 15 hours times $10 an hour. You owe me $150,000. And he goes, what? I don't owe you $150,000. I owe you $150,000. And I go, oh, no, you don't understand. I have my own math. <laughs> He's going to say, you're a nut. There's not my math or your math. There's just math. There's not my truth or your truth. There's just truth. Now, I know there's some parents in here going, oh, yeah, my kid brings home math, and it ain't my math. No, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not talking about that, right? Look, there, there's, there's, there's just one answer to the math problem. It's not my truth or your truth. It's just the truth, all right? Now, in our culture, sometimes it isn't said this way. Sometimes it's said this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Right? Well, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism is true for me. What do you say to this? This is also logically self-defeating. It's just a little bit more subtle. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, you want to ask, hey, is that true for everyone? It's true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, it's true for everybody, then true for you, but not for me can't be true because it's true for everybody. <laughs> Did I say that right? I know this can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, say, sure, go try that the next time you get pulled over. <laughs> Let's say you're going 100 miles an hour down the highway out here. Cop sees you, pulls you over, walks up to your car, knocks on the window. You put the glass down. He says, you're going 100. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply look back up at him and you go, ha, that's true for you but not for me. And you speed away. He can't give you a ticket if it's not true for you. No, if it's true, you're going 100. That's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to you at that time. It's just true. By the way, I go to a lot of churches. I normally ask people, do you think that Christianity is true? And most people, of course, will say yes. And then I ask them why. Do you know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? No, your faith doesn't change a thing about those things. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? Hey, look, there's another one. 
hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, well, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. This is a very important distinction. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead, that the scriptures are telling the truth. That's what we call apologetics. It doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry. It means we're giving evidence that a certain proposition is true. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you have to go from belief that to belief in. There's a difference. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called? Man, you guys are sharp tonight. James says, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you realize that if God exists, and he does, and if demons exist, and they do, just watch the news, <laughs> that they know that God exists better than we do? They're in the spiritual realm. But they don't trust in him. They don't want to. There's a difference between belief that and belief in. You can know something's true and not assent to it. In fact, we know this in relationships. When I first met my wife 38 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> That's the difference between belief that and belief in. Now, most of the time when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind. After you know that Jesus is the Savior, trust in him. In fact, John, the gospel writer who wrote a biography we call a gospel. In the last verse of chapter 20, I'm paraphrasing it, he says this. He puts belief that and belief in into one sentence. He says, these things were written down so that you know that Jesus is the Savior. You may know that Jesus is the Savior. And by trusting in him, you may have life in his name. See, there's a difference between belief that and belief in. Belief that is just of the head. Belief in is not only of the head, it's of the heart. And if you don't want to believe in, you don't have to. God's not going to force you into heaven against your will. If you don't want him now, you're not going to want him in eternity. So faith is not blind. Faith doesn't mean I have no evidence, I'm just going to believe. Faith means trusting in what you have good evidence to believe that is true. Trusting in what you have good evidence to believe that is true. And everybody does that. Atheists do that. Christians do that. Muslims do. Even agnostics do that. They're trusting in that they don't have enough evidence to make a decision. That's, that's a belief. Or how about this? You're going to hear this. There's no truth in anything but science. Somebody says there's no truth in anything but science. If you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask them? Yeah, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove this claim? No, that's a philosophical claim. That's not a statement of science. That's a statement about science. In fact, you can't do science without, a, without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. In fact, when you get a PhD, what does the PhD stand for? Not phenomenally dumb. Nice try. It starts for philosophy of doctorate in history, biology, physics, whatever it is. Philosophy undergirds every. You can't read the Bible without philosophy. You can't read your iPhone without philosophy. It's right thinking about reality. Philosophy includes logic. Philosophy includes certain principles of right thinking and certain assumptions you need to make. In fact, in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, we just have a few of them left over there. We sold most of them last night. Um, we have a little section in there, and here's the title of the section. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Now, why do I say that? Because all data needs to be gathered and all data needs to be interpreted. And who does that? Scientists do that. Science doesn't do that. I mean, do you ever wonder why you've gotten conflicting advice on COVID? You say, follow the science. Well, who's science? Look, if scientists have good data and they interpret it properly, you'll get good advice. If they have good data or, or uh, good data, don't interpret it properly, you're going to get bad advice. If they've got bad data, it doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're going to get bad advice. If there's a political agenda, oh, that'll never happen. <laughs> the United States government and big tech were censoring epidemiologists from Stanford University who had a different viewpoint? Are you telling me that science got politicized? So people could make a lot of money and exercise their power? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. 
that strip clubs, abortion clinics, and liquor stores could be open, but apparently the churches were not essential. You telling me that's science? No, that's politics. So you always have to look at what's going on. How are they interpreting the data? Do they have good data? Are they fudging the data one way or another or the interpretation one way or another? By the way, this is the same dispute you have between the people who think that we evolved and other people who say, no, we were created, we were intelligently designed. Do you realize that scientists on both sides of this issue are looking at the same data? But they come to different conclusions. Why? Well, look, if you're open that there could be a God out there, you might be open to one of the two types of causes that could have done this. You're open to a natural cause. You're also open to a non-natural or intelligent cause. Those are the only two types of causes. But if you're an atheist and you've ruled out intelligent causes before you look at the evidence, is there any wonder you always interpret the data to say it's got to be a natural cause? Is that a result of the evidence or a result of their philosophical presupposition? I don't know. You've got to look at it. But if you're ruling out the only other alternative, you're, you only have one game in town. Oh, how about this? This is the, probably the biggest one in our culture. You ought not judge! In fact, Jesus said don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrites? All right, let's put Jesus aside for just a second. What's the problem logically with the claim? Yeah, if somebody says you ought not judge, you might want to ask them, hey, isn't that a judgment? Or you can put your hands on your hips and say, if we're not to judge, then why are you judging me for judging? Notice it's a judgment. You say, wait, didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. All right, for you Christians in here, I know this is going to sound weird for just a minute, but stick with me. It's true. There are no verses in the Bible. <laughs> there are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when Matthew was writing his biography that we call a gospel, he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No, when were the chapter and verse divisions put in? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text. Why? It'd be really hard to find your way around this big series of books that we put under one binding that we call the Bible if you didn't have numbers. I mean, imagine if you go to church one Sunday morning and your pastor has a big Bible without numbers in it and you have a big Bible without numbers in it and he simply looks out at you and he goes, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot. You go, <laughs> you can't do that, right? You need numbers to find your way around. The problem is, we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. You can't do that. You've got to read around the passage. And by the way, well, some of you are going to hate me for this, but I don't care. My flight's tomorrow morning. I'm out of here, okay? This is why, you, if you're a Christian, you should never say that Jeremiah 29, 11 is a promise to you. What's Jeremiah, tw you know Jeremiah 29, 11. Oh, the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Plans to prosper you. Is that a promise to 21st century Christians living in Northwest Missouri? No, who's that a promise to? That's a promise to the exiles who were taken by force by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC from Judah all the way to Babylon, modern day Iraq. God said that through Jeremiah, that 70 years later, he was going to prosper them and bring them back into the land, that he has a plan for them. It's not a promise to 21st century Christians. I always tell people who claim that Jeremiah 29, 11 is a promise to them. I say, why don't you claim Jeremiah 44, 11 is a promise to you? What's Jeremiah 44, 11? You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 is? It's what God promised to do to the exiles that went to Egypt, and he warned them, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you and all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. <laughs> you don't see that on a coffee mug. You don't see that on a birthday card, happy birthday. And we'll destroy you and all Judah. That is so sweet, Grandma. Thank you so much. No. We're taking stuff out of context. We just take the stuff we like, and it doesn't apply to you. And the same thing is true with Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Does Jesus just say, don't judge, and he stops right there? No, he says, judge not. Lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others, you'll be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment. You notice that, you hypocrite? 
Take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. Don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments tonight just getting over here, and now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy. (laughs) Everybody makes judgments. Atheists make judgments. They judge there's no God. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The Bible's not telling the truth. There is no objective meaning to life. When you die, you're just going to become worm food. It's over. It's hopeless. Have a nice day. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? In fact, Jesus says in John 7, 24, he says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Get the facts before you make judgments, in other words. I will say this, Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? The Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? What was their job? What did they do? They were the religious and political leaders of Israel. Many of them were on the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish ruling council to whom Rome delegated day-to-day lawmaking authority. They were the politicians. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What does Jesus do in John chapter 2? He makes a whip, and he goes, and he jacks people up in the temple. Sweet and gentle Jesus did this? Yes! And then he's having an argument with these Pharisees, as recorded in John 8. And he's right in the middle of an argument with him when he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ? (laughs) You imagine you're having an argument with somebody and you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. (laughs) And then in Matthew 23, Jesus really goes after these Pharisees where he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs. But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. How often have you heard those passages talked about? Yet many of you in this room know know those passages are true because some of you are divided in your own home over Jesus. Jesus did not come to bring unity. He came to bring unity in the church, but not with the world. Jesus was tough. In fact, why did they kill him? Do you think Jesus got killed for walking around saying, love your neighbor? Love your neighbor. What? You must die. No, that doesn't get you killed. Jesus was killed because, number one, he claimed to be God, which was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And number two, he was killed because he spoke truth to power, particularly the temple authorities who wanted him dead. In fact, I think Caiaphas, the high priest, I think he knew Jesus was the Messiah. Because right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, what does Caiaphas say? It's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. Caiaphas was going to be out of a job if Jesus succeeded. So he thought he'd get rid of the problem. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. You ever notice when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if you say to your best friend, I really love you. You're such a wonderful person. I wish I could be like you. You think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? <laughs> like your friend's never going to say that, right? I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get mad at you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. 
few military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy for eight years, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> for you military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. As Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. We don't want people telling us the truth. We're running from the truth because we want to do our own thing. So we have to make judgments, but we have to make judgments without being judgmental. In fact, for you Christians in here, you're not going to make it to heaven because you're any better than anyone else. The only way any of us are going to be in his presence is because of the grace he's freely given us. It's his work, not ours. Now, we could spend more time, but we don't have time. We've got to keep moving. I just want to sum this whole thing up this way. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? <laughs> Can everybody see that? Which means that relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Tragically, many of our high schools and most of our universities have bought into postmodernism. Ladies and gentlemen, why would you pay thousands of dollars a year to have some professor tell you the truth that there is no truth? I mean, what are you here to learn? You here to learn just opinions? Or are you here to learn truth? Of course there's truth. It's ridiculous to deny it. You're uttering a truth claim when you say that. So, we go to a lot of colleges. This actually is a picture of an event we did at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkley does. <laughs> and uh, we set up a microphone. We'll have this microphone set up here a little bit later for Q&A. And uh, sometimes I ask people who ask me questions a question, but that's not fair of me to do so unless I give you the question in advance. So I'm going to give you the question in advance, okay, so you can think about it. If you're not a Christian in here, thank you for being here. But I may ask you a question if you ask me one, and here's the question I might ask you. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, No! No? Wait, I thought you claimed to be reasonable. I thought you claimed to be rational. How is it that you wouldn't believe something that was true? Well, it's not a rationality problem. It's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God of their own lives. You see, most of us, we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. We're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of fun but selfish and sinful things, yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room who's over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. I'm going to do it my way. No, you're not. Not very long. If you are, you're going to wind up probably addicted, broken, alone, and prematurely dead. You want contentment? You've got to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. So always ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If the person hesitates or says no, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. So during the Q&A, we can talk about what, what you might do with someone like that. But I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. So truth does exist. The next question, is it true that God exists? And we're going to spend most of the rest of our time here before we get to your questions. I mentioned there are three arguments for the existence of God we're going to look at. The first argument is from the beginning of the universe, known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological comes from the Greek word, Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says if the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, life, then there has to be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see some of that here in a minute. The third argument doesn't have any science behind it. It's more philosophical in nature, yet it's the argument you've all intuitively understood since you were a very small child. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to come across the border in the middle of the night and murder babies, women, and then burn them after you rape them. Then there has to be a God. Why? 
Because if there is no God, then all of that is just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against some terrorist's opinion. If there is no standard beyond humanity, a standard of righteousness and goodness that we're obligated to obey, then all that murder, torture, rape is all just a matter of opinion. And we know these things aren't a matter of opinion. It's really wrong to do that. If that's true, there's got to be a standard of really right that we're obligated to obey. That is what we mean by God's nature. We'll get to that later. We've got to start here, though, at the cosmological argument. You got to admit it was worth coming out here tonight just to see God do that. <laughs> Some of you say, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. <laughs> now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, I know there's some Christians in here going, uh, Frank, you know we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. <laughs> in fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists are admitting it. Stephen Hawking famously said, who some of you may know he was a medical miracle because he had got ALS like 40 years, 50 years before he died. Normally ALS will take you out in a couple of years. He lived for decades with it. Anyway, he was probably the most prominent physicist in the world until he died about six years ago. He put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, despite being an atheist, Hawking admitted this. Now, he tried to come up with another explanation other than God. He failed, but he's admitting the evidence that space, time, and matter literally came into existence out of nothing. Another colleague of his, a colleague by the name of Alexander Vilenkin, was an agnostic and still is. He's at uh, Tufts University. He said this, with the proof now in place, cosmologists, and by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup. Right? This is someone that studies the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, there's two words in this quote I want to draw your attention to. One is the word proof. Unusual for scientists to use the word proof. Why? Because science, by definition, is tentative. Scientific theories are routinely overturned when more evidence comes in. But Vilenkin says, I see so much evidence pointing to a beginning, I'm willing to call it a proof. The other interesting word is the word problem. Why is it a problem there's a cosmic beginning? Because if space, time, and matter literally had a beginning, then whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be beyond nature, what we would call supernature. We'll get to that in a minute. We're not going to go through the evidence from science for this. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. You know what is controversial is not that the universe had a beginning, but what caused the universe to have a beginning. That's what we're going to talk about in a minute. But before we do, I want to show you one line of philosophical argumentation that I think is indisputable. And it shows that the universe had a beginning. Take a look at this for a second, this timeline. Here's the present. Here's today. There's yesterday. There's the day before yesterday. There's last week. Okay. Let's say we don't know how far back this timeline goes. Here's my question. Can this timeline here be infinite into the past? No. Why not? Why can't it be? We'd never get to today if there were an infinite, numbers before, an infinite number of days before today. Why? Because you'd always have to live another day before you got to this day if there's an infinite number of days before today. So you'd never actually get to today. I know this can give you intellectual constipation, but just think about it. The bottom line is this. If the past were infinite, today never would have arrived, but here we are. So what does that mean? There can only be a finite number of days before today, which means time had a beginning. And if time had a beginning, what could have created time? Only something outside of time. Something timeless. And if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No. 
This answers the question, who made God? No one made God. He's the uncaused first cause. He's outside of time. He's eternal. He always was and always will be. In the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures, this is called the great I am. In fact, Jesus himself in John chapter 8 says, before Abraham was born, I am. Who's he quoting at that point? He's quoting from Exodus 3.14, the burning bush. Do you remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? <laughs> Moses says to God, who should I tell the Israelites you are? And God says, tell them I am sends you. What does I am mean? I am means the self-existent eternal one. The being that had no beginning, the being that will have no end, the being that just bees and gives being to everything else. So science is never going to change this. This appears to be airtight that there was a beginning. So we're just going to jump to the bottom line. If the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. We've got two options from the evidence. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? What do you think? No one created something out of nothing, or someone created something out of nothing? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> what, what, what? Number two, right? Now, number two is a miracle, but at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. For, s for some of you who are here a little bit earlier, you got here early. I showed you a little video from Lawrence Krauss, the atheistic scientist who tried to figure out how the universe could come into existence without God out of nothing. He failed. And even Stephen Colbert showed him that. Okay, you can look, search YouTube for Colbert uh, Krauss. You can see that video. The point here is, is that he believes that no one created something out of nothing. Do you realize that everyone believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in more than one. We believe in this one and many others. But atheists believe in a miracle, at least Lawrence Krauss does, that no one created something out of nothing. Now, which view takes more faith? Blind faith. Yeah, number one. In fact, here's a question to ask an atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? This is the philosopher Leibniz posed this question. If there is no God, why does anything exist? Why do you exist? Why do I exist? Why does the universe exist? Why do butterflies exist? Why does root beer exist? Well, we know why. We, we created it, right? I mean, but we took pre-existing materials. And, I mean, why does anything exist if there is no God? Now, if it's true... And the evidence seems to show it's true that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. What could have created that? Here's where the controversy comes in. I think it's quite clear the only thing that could have created it is something outside of space, time, and matter. Something that's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing. Personal in order to choose to create. Why personal? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice and only persons can make choices. Right? Impersonal forces don't make choices. Like gravity doesn't go, look, if Turek drops that remote one more time, I'm not going to pull it to his hand. <laughs> no, it just does the same thing over and over again. You would need a person to make a choice to go from nothing to something. Also, the being would have to have a mind to make a choice. So ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent being or cause, who do you think of? God. You say, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet, this could be Allah at this point or some other theistic or deistic God. But if we keep going through the evidence and we realize that Jesus really did rise from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we've got six attributes, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent for a first cause that could be the God of the Bible. That's the first argument. The second argument is the argument from design, and there's two aspects to this. The universe appears to be designed, and you appear to be designed, but let's look at the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades that the universe is fine-tuned, that if you were to change any one of a number of factors about our universe virtually imperceptibly, there would either be no universe or certainly no universe that could support life. And even atheists agree with this. Again, Stephen Hawking said this. 
The ex if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. In other words, if the expansion rate from the very beginning were any different, none of us would be here. Now, you can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation for this. You can't posit that. Why? Because the expansion rate did not evolve to a particular point by chance, whatever that means. The expansion rate started exactly where it needed to start. It appears to me that the same being that created space, time, and matter is the same being that fine-tuned that expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be so this universe could exist. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I, so let me give you an illustration. Stack the entire North American continent from Central America all the way to Greenland in dimes all the way to the moon. That's 238,000 miles. And do that on a billion other North American continents. Stack them in dimes all the way to the moon. Then take all those billion piles of dimes, put them in one huge pile, mark one dime red, mix it in, blindfold a friend, throw them on the pile, tell him to pick one dime at random. The chance that he would pick that one marked dime is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that dime? No. No. You say, well, maybe this could have happened by chance. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance, he was just here. No. <laughs> chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do a thing. You know what scientists mean when they use the word chance? They mean, uh, we don't know. Look, there's only two possible reasons for that value being where it is. Somebody designed it to be there, or it wasn't designed to be there. What makes the most sense? Somebody, by the way, this is, I just showed you two of about a dozen of these. Change any one of these factors about our universe imperceptibly. Any one of them, we don't exist. We don't have time to go through the rest of them. But if you add the solar system, there's at least 100 about our solar system. In fact, let's take a look at the solar system for a second. Here we are, third rock from the sun right here. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away from the sun, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is? That's a lie. It's way too cold here in the winter. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why not? What does Jupiter do for us? Yes, Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you see these dark marks here? Those dark marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Saturn does the same thing for us. In fact, you want to see the size of the planets? Here they are in order, size, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. And what if Pluto identifies as a planet? What then? You bigots. <laughs> Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on uh, Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus? Now, see it way over here? 
That's Arcturus. That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here. Look, I don't name the stars, all right? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And that's just in our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius to go 30 trillion miles. A number of years ago, my wife and I took our three sons to Tucson, Arizona. That's where my in-laws lived. And we took them to the Desert Museum on the south side of Tucson. If you ever get a chance to go there, you go there at night. On a clear night, you can see thousands of stars in the sky. So we're out there this one night, like just like 25 years ago when we had a space shuttle. Remember the space shuttle used to go around the Earth? And the, and the guide said, wow, it's so clear tonight that if we look up at 9.03, we will see the space shuttle in orbit. I said, oh, come on, we're not going to see the space shuttle. I mean, it's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. Oh, me of little faith. At 9.03, the guide goes, look! <laughs> we look up in the sky about 70 degrees above the horizon. There's an object streaking out of the western desert sky relative to us about like this. I mean, it's really cooking. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. <laughs> Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up that the sun was still reflecting off of it. And when it got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle. <laughs> You'd be five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation and try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away, 30 trillion miles, if we could go five miles per second. How long do you think it would take us? 30 trillion miles. <laughs> a long time. Yeah, you must be a math major. It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star inside our galaxy an average distance away, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years. You would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. It took us nine years just to get to Pluto. I think, think about this. Our solar system, it was the size of a quarter with the sun in the center, Pluto at the outer rim. You know where the next nearest star is? It's over two football fields away. We're not going anywhere in space. Even if we go light speed, you know what light speed is? 186,000 miles per second. It would take us almost four years to get to the next nearest star. There's no way we're going to be able to do it. It's just too far and it's too dangerous. But let's say we do figure out light speed. We get to another planetary system. Now, this is going to be a little bit disturbing, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. You've got to listen closely. The volume's low. You've got to listen closely. But imagine we get to another planetary system, we plant our flag, and then this happens. Beans are not for astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. 
Now, to show you how analytical my wife is, I showed her that little video, and she smiled just a little bit, and then she said, that's illogical. There's no sound in space. <laughs> now, notice what the psalmist says about this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. If it's going to take 200,000 years at five miles a second just to go between two stars in our galaxy, and there are apparently billions of galaxies out there, how big is the universe? And is this supposed to tell us something about God? Well, you know, the Hubble's telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope helped us discover how big the universe is. I don't know if you can see the bottom of this uh, here. This is the southern hemisphere. Right here, these are uh, mountains. And about 20 years ago, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on one piece of that sky, 1 26 millionth of that sky to be exact. What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You can Google this. You can find it in the public domain. I'm about to show you the little video they found as a result of zooming out at that 1 26 millionth of the sky. There's no audio. It's just video. You guys ready? Here it is, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Here are the constellations. Now let's go see what Hubble found. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. Each of these galaxies having billions of stars of their own. And to go from one star to another star just in our galaxy going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years. If you find 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six billionth of the sky, how many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the earth, times 100,000. And to go from one star to another star going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I never want to hear anybody at Missouri Western State University ever use the word awesome again unless you're talking about God or the heavens. Awesome shot, dude. Awesome TikTok video, dude. Awesome shirt, dude. No! What are you going to save for God or the heavens if you're throwing awesome around for stuff that ain't awesome. Now, if this is supposed to give us an idea of what God is like, a physical representation of an immaterial being, which it is, we're in trouble. Why? Because if this is supposed to demonstrate his degree of justice, in other words, his justice is infinite, and all of us have been unjust, we're in trouble. Thankfully, though, he's also infinitely loving. He's not just infinitely just. So what does he do? I only showed you the first half of the verse from Psalm 103. Here's the second half. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How has he removed our transgressions from us? He's infinitely just. He can't allow me to go unpunished if he's infinitely just. He can't allow you to go unpunished if he's infinitely just. So what does he do? He has to find an innocent substitute to punish in our place. Otherwise, he doesn't remain just. But where is he going to find an innocent substitute who hasn't sinned themselves? The only place he's going to find one is in himself. So he adds humanity to his deity. He comes to earth. He allows the creatures he created and rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could take our punishment on himself and he could remain just while justifying us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. 
It's not just, well, I just said so, I'm the only way. There's no other way an infinitely just being can allow us to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. This is why Paul, in his great letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 26, says, God remains just and is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's why Jesus is the only way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the heavens and you see stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 earths, and it's going to take you over 200,000 years at five miles a second just to go between two of those stars, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, they're not made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, the heavens were made for you. And here's the second aspect of the design argument. You're designed. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case if you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. <laughs> but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book. And it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this, friends. This is the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? And by the way, you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying, I ought not impose ought nots. Well, why do you get to impose that ought not on me, but I don't get to impose any ought nots on you? Actually, the better answer is this. When somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, I think you ought to say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that abortion's wrong, that, that rape is wrong, that you shouldn't mutilate children, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. Look, if you don't like the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. 
From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. Some cells became brain cells, others lung cells, others heart cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million. Knock it off. I mean, are you thinking about this? Are you going, wait a minute, Frank, i got to concentrate. New red blood cells coming up. No. This is just happening. How's it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature's going in a direction. For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? Is, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That all of nature's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be someone directing it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I get frustrated when atheists think they figured out Aristotle and Aquinas. They haven't. Aristotle and Aquinas are not talking about a historical Big Bang cause. In fact, Aristotle mistakenly thought the universe was eternal. He's saying even if the universe is eternal, you need a right now cause to keep everything going the way it's going. In other words, it's a cause every single second the universe exists. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What happens to the music the second the band stops playing? Music's over. Same thing's true with God. God creates the universe. He creates you, he creates the natural laws that govern the universe, and he sustains the universe. He sustains you and the natural laws that govern you. This is why the Apostle Paul could come along and say, in him we live and move and have our being, and Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. So this is a right now cause. It's in addition to the historical Big Bang cause. Now, there's a book that I wrote called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. If you want to get into that argument more, we don't have it here, but you can get it on our website. We've got to go to our final argument for God tonight. This is the moral argument. And probably the best way to look at this argument is to talk football. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six. That's when he throws it to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know? Well, not just the score. What do you have to know about the game? Not just the rules. Okay, but why, why do you care which way the ball goes? What do you have to know about the game? What's the point? You're getting closer. You got to know the purpose of the game. Right? If you don't know the purpose of the game, you can't say a touchdown gets you closer to the purpose and a pick six takes you further away. Only if you know the purpose, which is to score more points than the other team, can you say a touchdown is a good play and a pick six is a bad play. Now notice, in football, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When the Chiefs play a game, they just show up on the field. They don't set the purpose up. They don't set the rules up. Everything's already preset. Where do those rules come from? Where does the purpose come from? It comes from outside the game. The commissioner, the owners, the competition committee get together, and every once in a while they tweak the rules uh, because the game of football is arbitrary. It could be different, but the game of life is not arbitrary. The purpose and the rules come from outside the game, but they're based on the nature 
of the creator of the game. And if there is no nature, if there is no God out there, you can't say there's any purpose to life. If there's no purpose to life, you can't say that this is the right way to live it and this is the wrong way to live it. Just like if there's no purpose to a football game, you can't say here's a good play and here's a bad play. In fact, if there is no God, the Nazis were not wrong. That's just your opinion. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Well, you might like love better, obviously, but that's just a preference if there's no God. If there is no God, there are no human rights. Do you realize that in our country, we seem to be inventing rights every 10 minutes? And many people who say they have these new rights are atheists. Do you realize that there's no God, there are no rights? Everything's just a matter of opinion. There's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There's no such thing as trans rights because there's no such thing as human rights. There aren't rights for anything unless God exists, and then you gotta figure out how does God want us to behave? Then you can figure out what are the right rights and what are not rights. If there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong, yet we all know they are. If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. If you're a religious person, if you're a Christian or somebody in here, what objection do you get most from non-Christians about you? You're a hypocrite. Now, if someone ever calls you a hypocrite, you know what you ought to say? You're right. I am. But what does that prove? Actually, you know what? You've just given evidence for God. Why? Because there's nothing wrong with hypocrisy unless God exists because there's nothing wrong with anything unless God exists. That's just your opinion. Now I know you probably know people, in fact you might be one of those people if you're not a Christian. You might not be a Christian because basically Christians have been jerks to you and I get it. Religious people have done a lot of evil things in the world. But what does that prove? Atheists have done a lot of evil things in the world too. Doesn't show you whether it's true or false. In fact, jo Dr. John Dixon, an historian from Down Under, asks you to consider this question. If, if you're staying away from God because of Christians, he asks you to consider this. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Just because I don't live up to Jesus' standards doesn't mean Jesus isn't true. Or Jesus isn't the standard. He is the standard. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In fact, um, how many have heard of Christopher Hitchens? You guys remember who Christopher Hitchens was? Christopher Hitchens was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. And... Uh, a number of years ago, I had two debates with him. You can see these debates on our YouTube channel. Christopher wrote the book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And in our debates, I kept asking Christopher, by what standard are you saying religion's evil? Because you don't have a standard of good to even know what evil is. And I said, you know, Christopher, a lot of what you say in your book is true. Religious people have done evil things. But you're kind of proving our worldview. We agree we've done evil things. That's why we need a savior. In fact, I said to him, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. I mean, if I was perfect, would I need a savior? No. And so when people say I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> the church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. That's why you, one of the reasons you go to church to get sanctified. It'd be like saying I can't go down to the gym. There's too many out of shape people down there. It's like, why are they there? That's why they're there. And by the way, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. The terrorists poison religion. Actually, you know what the terrorists are doing? They're just obeying the Quran. Just read Surah 8 and Surah 9. That's what they're doing. And it's been going on for 1,400 years. It has nothing to do with land. 
It's been going on since Muhammad. It's in the charter. You don't have to take my word for it. Go read Hamas Charter, Article 13. Land deals, conferences are a vain waste of time. The only solution is jihad. That's what they say, and that's what they do. Tolerance is no better than intolerance. Are Christians commanded to be tolerant? No, tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. We're supposed to love people, not tolerate them. Here's the problem. We think in our country that love means approval. Love does not mean approval. Every parent knows this. How many people in here are parents? All right, how many people in here are former children? Okay, good, good. That's all of us then, right? Question. If your parents tolerated everything you wanted to do when you were 13, would they have been loving parents? No, they wouldn't have been loving at all. You need, they'd be enabling you to do evil. If you love someone, you need to stand in the way of evil, not tolerate it. That's not loving. In fact, Thomas Sowell, who said everything well, said it this way. When you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Too often we tell people what they want to hear because we don't want to take the blowback from them. That's not loving them. That's protecting ourselves. If we truly want to love people, we need to tell them the truth. Finally, if there is no God, you can't complain about the problem of evil. Why? Because there's no such thing as evil unless God exists. Why? Well, C.S. Lewis thought there was no God when he was in World War I because his best friend was killed in World War I. And he said, there can't be a good God. There's too much injustice in the world, too much injustice. And then one day he had an epiphany. And he actually wrote it in the book, Mere Christianity. Here's what he said. As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. Something can't be not right unless something is right. So, evil can't exist unless good exists, and good can't exist unless God exists. You say, well, why can't evil exist on its own? Evil is a parasite in good. It's a lack in good. Evil is like, it's like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you've got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You've got nothing, right? Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you've got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto, okay? It doesn't exist on its own. Or you could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you gotta have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have evil without good. You can't have shadows without sunshine. So if evil exists, and we all know it does, then God exists. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Evil does not disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. Now, maybe during the Q&A we can talk about why does God allow certain evils? That's another question, but you can't say he doesn't exist because nothing would be wrong unless something was right and what we mean by right is God's nature. Now, Let's sum these three arguments up. From the cosmological argument, we know the first cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. From the design argument, we get more information that he's intelligent. We also see that he's sustaining the universe. And from the moral argument, we can see that this being is also morally perfect. Now, from these three arguments, we get a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator who created and sustains all things and is moral. This is the God of biblical Christianity, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural revelation. Everybody has natural revelation. You don't need a Bible to know that there's a creator, and he's a moral creator and designer. Now... If someone were to ever ask you, how do you know that God exists? Here's what I think you should say. I know God by his effects. I'm reasoning from effect back to cause. If there's a creation, 
That's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause of creator. If there's design, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause of designer. If there's a moral law written on my heart, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a moral law giver. If there's evidence that a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause. Who could raise somebody from the dead? God. You're reasoning from effect to cause. That's what scientists do. In fact, even if you think you've had a personal experience with God, you're doing the same thing. The personal experience is the effect, and you're reasoning back to say God is the cause of the personal experience. You're always reasoning from effect back to cause. Now, there's some of you may say, well, don't atheists have arguments against this? Some of you here earlier, you saw Lawrence Krauss has attempted it. They do not have good arguments against it. In fact... Most atheists today are materialists. They think that you're just a molecular machine, that every thought you have is the result of the laws of physics. You don't have free will. You don't have a mind. You just have a brain. You don't have a soul. You just have a body. You're nothing but a moist robot. This is materialism. And C.S. Lewis rebutted this better than anyone, so I'm just going to show you what C.S. Lewis said. It's a two slide quote. Check out what Lewis said. He said this in a BBC broadcast during World War II. He said, suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? But if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. Boom. <laughs> you can't say it better than that. Atheistic materialism has made reason itself impossible. All right, now, what about miracles? We don't have time to cover it tonight, but let me just ask you one question. What is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, resurrection's easy compared to the greatest. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. Well, we have atheists admitting the evidence for the first verse. As I mentioned, they don't think it's God, but what else could it be? If space, matter, and time had a beginning, it would seem the cause would have to be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent, exactly what we would call the attributes of God. So if Genesis 1-1 is true, then miracles like resurrections are at least possible. And the reason you may have never seen a resurrection is because if resurrections occurred routinely, what would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No. It's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event. Miracles are very rare events. And we talk about evidence uh, about the New Testament documents telling the truth. And uh, we can deal more of that with, um, uh, we, uh, we talk about miracles and then we, we, we talk about uh, is the New Testament telling the truth. Uh, we can deal more of that with, uh, at, at, during the Q&A. If you want to go further, I only have the, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist book, just a few of them over there, but just text this word evidence to this phone number, 1-855-909-0582. If you text the word evidence to that phone number, I'm going to send you this entire PowerPoint presentation, all 362 slides in a PDF format. You can look at it whenever you want. Uh, and a bunch of other PowerPoint presentations for free. Uh, we do we have a few of these DVDs too. They're seven hours long of the entire presentation given with PowerPoint and all that. People use it. You can get workbooks with it. People use it for uh, small groups and, and uh, home schools and Sunday schools, that kind of thing. We're now teaching online courses. In fact, this week we're starting a new online course on the book of Galatians. We're going to go verse by verse of the book of Galatians. I'll be your instructor. If you want to check out online courses, uh, at our website, crossexamine.org, we actually have live Q&A Q uh, Zoom sessions if you take the premium version of that course. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it you Twitface. It's, it's kind of a Jersey thing. Have you signed up for you Twitface yet? Actually, we're on Instagram and TikTok as well. 
Uh, the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. Check that out if you would. Don't forget about the TV show. And finally, if you don't do anything else, download the free cross-examined app. Two words in the app store. It not only has the TV show streaming, it has the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast on there. It even has a quick answer section. So you might be having lunch with somebody, and they say something that's wrong about Christianity, but you're not quite sure how to answer it. All you need to do is take out your droid or your iPhone and go, hey, hang on, I'm getting a text. Hey, what about this? The answer's right there on your phone. All right, so let's, if we could go through the rest of the evidence, we see evidence that it's true. The question is, so what if it's true? So what if Christianity's true? Well, the best news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation. We had to earn golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn, but there's nothing more difficult in the United States Navy to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through, maybe 5%. Those that do make it through and become SEALs wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that died for them, the one that saved them. That's what we're supposed to do. But our culture says, oh, no, 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 put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your gender identity or your sexual preference or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your job or your bank account. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that none of those things are ultimate, that you can lose just about every one of those? I mean, if you put your identity in your sexual preference, what happens when you can no longer sexually perform? You no longer have an identity? If you put your identity in another person, what happens when, God forbid, that person dies or leaves you? You no longer have an identity? You put your identity in your job. What happens when you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? No, you can lose all those things. You were meant, I was meant, to put our identity in the one that died for us, our Savior. The one who not only went to the cross, but then rose again. Do you realize that Christianity is the only worldview where you don't achieve your identity, you receive your identity? If you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. And there's always somebody that can do it better. But if you simply receive your identity as a gift, nobody can ever take that away from you. You know, you can lose your ability to perform sexually. You can lose your family. You can lose your job. You can lose your fortune. You can lose your talents. You can lose your mind. Ultimately, you're going to lose your life. The only thing you can't lose is your Savior, Jesus. So if you haven't accepted what he's provided for you for free, why wouldn't you accept it? It's an eternal identity that you can't lose. All the pressure's off you. He's done all the work. If you've never accepted that, tonight you ought to. Only if you realize that he might come in and change your life a little bit, maybe a lot. All right, with that being said, we're going to go to questions. But before we go to questions, Paul, where are you, Paul? Can you tell people, come get down here and tell people where they can meet with your group on campus because we don't want this just to be an event tonight. Uh, we want people to uh, get plugged in here on campus if they want to go further with other Christians and learn more about this kind of material and others. So tell them your group and when you meet and where you meet. So, uh, but I, I represent Christian Challenge, and we meet on Thursday nights. And actually, I think most of our ministries meet on Thursday nights. Um, so we meet in a building right across the street from campus. We always have dinner beforehand, and uh, 
we'll, we'll be hanging out in the foyer afterwards. If you have any questions, you want to talk about any of the things that, well, not anything that Frank has said. But, you know, anyway, if you want to talk more, we'd love to talk with you. I'm going to introduce these guys. They'll tell a little bit about their groups. My name is Chuck Simmons with Christian Campus Fellowship. Uh, we meet on Thursday nights as well. Upstairs, Blum 223, unless we get booted out of there, sometimes we do. Um, we're all about small groups, so um, we are starting a small group actually this coming Tuesday. If anybody from the Missouri Western Campus is interested in going through the Case for Christ for, with uh, Lee Strobel, we'll be doing a weekly study through that as the semester closes and into next semester as well. So we'll be handing out flyers if you're interested in that. Carry on with a little bit of adding reason to what you believe. So, yeah. And you'll love anything by Lee Strobel, great writer. Graham, go ahead. Hello, my name is Graham. I'm the Young Adults Director at Grace Calvary Chapel. So if you're here and you don't have a home church or you don't have a, a Young Adults ministry at your church, we'd love to see you uh, just like them, you know, free dinner. Uh, so we'll feed you and then we'll feed you with the word. Uh, that's on Thursday nights, starts at six. There's more information on all these ministries out of the table. Uh, we're also hosting in the same very room, uh, Elisa Childers, that's two Fridays from this Friday. So this Friday, two Fridays from then, that's November 10th, we'll be hosting Elisa Childers here. Uh, another uh, apologist, she'll be talking along these same lines. Uh, someone who works with Frank, he knows her. So love to see you guys out here for that too. You love Elisa, she talks a lot about so-called progressive Christianity. So, if you can be here on Friday night, the 10th of November, you'll enjoy that. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Bloss. I'm with uh, College Young Life, and we meet at the Abundant Life Church over on Farron at 7 o'clock on Thursdays. Very good. Thank you. Can you put that mic back in there? <laughs> All right, we're going to go to Q&A now. Uh, so, since no one likes to ask the first question, we're going to move right on to the second question. Uh, second question right here at the mic. It's got to be at the mic because there's people watching out there. They won't be able to hear unless you come on up to the mic. And so uh, just come on up and line up. Don't wait till the guy sits down because it'll just take too long. Yes, sir. We'll start right here. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Ryan. Ryan, go ahead, sir. <clears throat> um, I was wondering if we could agree that uh, Jesus established a church uh, that would uphold the faith. That would uphold the faith. Would uphold the faith. What do you mean by that? Um, that would follow scripture and that would um, baptize new Christians. Um, all these things are in the New Testament. Well, he did say the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yes, he said that in, I believe it's uh, Matthew 16 there in, in, um, in Caesarea Philippi. Yes. So should we strive for one church instead of divisions? Right. Well, we should strive for unity in the church on the essentials, but some of the non-essentials we may disagree over, but they're just that, they're non-essentials. And actually, I know this is going to sound odd, but I think different denominations, as long as they believe in the Bible, can be healthy. Why? Because different denominations may emphasize different worship styles that actually help different kinds of people to worship. Some people like liturgy, other people like a more free-flowing service. So I think it might be good to have different services and different ways of approaching the throne than everybody doing it the same way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that seem like kind of relative? Why, like, why do you like, say that? Like, uh, like some people may prefer um, the idea of abortions, like what's essential? No, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about essential matters. I'm not talking life and death here. I think we all have to agree on the essentials. But we may disagree on whether or not we should have a lot of liturgy or a lot of, say, praise and worship or hymns or different methods of worshiping. We may disagree over secondary issues like eschatology. You know, how is this whole thing going to end? And when people ask me, how's it going to end? I say, look, I'm not on the planning committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. All right. So I know we win in the end, and I'm not going to divide with my brothers and sisters who may disagree over how it's going to end, but we all agree it is going to end, and Jesus is going to come back and save us. Okay, I have one, one last question. Sure. Uh, like, what is the list of essentials, and like, who guides this list, who creates this list? How can you come up with this list? Well, it depends on what perspective you're taking. I think the authority is in the scriptures. 
And uh, the scriptures will point out, like Paul will say in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. And he talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and who Jesus appeared to. He talks about the gospel. And that saying that he has in there, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 7, is an ancient creed that goes all the way back to the resurrection event itself. Even skeptical scholars, atheists who study the New Testament, says that's, a, that's an early creed that goes way back to the event itself. Also, if you read Romans chapter 1, Paul puts the essentials of the faith in about the first 16 verses. There is a God. You are not him. He has two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. We're all sinners. Christ is the sacrifice. By trusting in him, by grace you will be saved, and he's going to come again. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, what's your name? Uh, my name is Jim. Jim, go ahead, sir. Uh, this might be lighter note and off topic, but it's okay. uh, I flew in the Navy probably about four years after you. So if you didn't know, Dr. Turk used to be like Goose in Top Gun. He was no, a... I wasn't. <laughs> I was actually in a big, ugly plane. Goose was in the sexy F-14. Okay. I was in the P-3. I yeah. flew EA-6Bs about four years after you. EA-6Bs? Yeah. All right, the EA-6Bs were the, uh, in the, uh, the jamming plane that the Navy flew off the carrier in order to jam enemy radar, and they had a gold-plated cockpit in order to protect them from some of the IR radiation. Did it work for you? Probably not. Okay, all right. <laughs> but I wrote a book myself, and I wanted to give you a signed copy of it. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that, Jim. Thank you so much. Oh, a tale of, it's, it's called Plans That Make God Laugh, A Tale of Aviation Perseverance and Faith. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. God bless you. Navy, never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead. Before I want to start, I want to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you for so, uh, the effort you put into these studies. Yes, sir, thank you. And Get a little closer to the mic if you could. What's your sorry. name? Cole. Cole, go ahead. I wanted to mention something. My Can you guys hear him? Is he being amplified? Is that no. thing shut off? Test, test, no, test. It's the other one. Test, test, test. There, yeah, you just got to okay, get close got it to real it. close. Go ahead, Cole. Go ahead. Um, I want to mention something my friend said uh -huh. before he started. So <clears throat> uh, you might find it humorous. So we got here early, and we waited around for a while, and he he eventually decides to go hunt for food. And so we're waiting around for him for a while, and then you eventually start the pre-show mm -hmm. with Stephen Colbert, and then he walks in, he sees Stephen Colbert, and he says, "Whoa." Is that Frank Turek from 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> He'll be here all night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Go ahead, Cole. My question is that it appears in your If God, Why Evil lectures, uh -huh. you justify the existence of suffering. Mm-hmm with a sort of utilitarian explanation by saying that the allowance of suffering leads to a higher good. Mm -hmm. But my question uh, is that it doesn't seem like the good in the world outweighs the suffering, that it seems like it becomes worth it in the end, because most people who've ever existed and will ever exist are destined for hell. First of all, how do we know that? I guess we don't. So that, would, that would be the question. Okay, how do we know that? And then secondly, how do we know that evil that occurs in this world doesn't have good effects later in this world and even into eternity? There's no way we could know that it didn't have those effects because of the ripple effect. For those of you that were up north last night, we went through this. Uh, talking about the ripple effect, right? That every event ripples forward to affect trillions of other events. And for example, I mean, just think about the ripple effects in your own life. You wouldn't be sitting here today if your parents didn't meet and their parents didn't meet and their parents didn't meet, right? All those ripples, just people meeting and, and uh, having children allowed us to be here today. We can't trace all those ripples, but a being outside of time and space can. So we can't say that because something evil occurs today has no ultimate good in it. There's no way of knowing whether it has good or not in it. You've just got to, you don't have the knowledge to know that. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So okay. 
let's say that only 49% of people who ever exist are saved. Do you mm-hmm. think that would be a theological problem? Do you think that somehow in the future that it'll come out in the end where most people are saved? Because uh, I'm saying that it seems weird. It, does, it seems like God shouldn't have created the world if most people who ever exist are destined for hell. Why? Because you're, what you're assuming there is a moral standard judging what God does, right? Here's something uh, that God can't do. He can't force free creatures to do what he wants. Because if he does that, they're not free, right? If he makes them robots, then they're not loving. So in order for us to have true love and true moral choice, he has to give us free will. And if he gives his free will, it might be that even a majority of people freely decide not to accept the the redemption that Christ has provided. Is God obligated not to create at all because more people reject him than accept him? Well, with utilitarianism, as far as I understand it, it, it's about weighing the good and the bad. So if more people go to hell, then wouldn't, under that ethical system, wouldn't it be considered Well, God's bad? not a utilitarian. God yeah. can bring, utilitarian is do whatever is the most good for the most people, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's smuggling in a moral law which defines what good is. Actually, I know this is going to sound a little bit odd, but if people sin and reject the salvation, and they get justice for that, that's a good thing. Okay? So just because everybody isn't saved, that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. They made their choice, and they don't want Jesus. They don't want to be with God in heaven. So it's not unjust of God to punish them. And as you you probably know, Cole, God isn't going to punish everybody at the same level of punishment He's going to be just in punishment. He's not going to punish an average unbeliever at the same level of punishment as, say, Hitler. You can read Luke 12 about this. Uh, It wouldn't be right. In the afterlife, nobody's going to get a raw deal. In fact, you can look at it this way. There's only two things any of us are going to get ultimately. You're either going to get justice or you're going to get grace. Which would you rather have? I don't want justice. If I get justice, I'm toast. But if I get grace and I freely accept grace, he gets the glory for that because I didn't do anything for it. He did everything for it. But if I don't accept grace, I'm getting what I deserve. And what, getting what I deserve is a good thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a good explanation. But then why then in your If God, Why Evil lectures uh-huh. do you use a utilitarian explanation to justify suffering if you think that utilitarianism ultimately fails. Well, I'm not using a utilitarianism to justify suffering. What I'm saying is, is that there are goods that come out of evil that we may not see, and that's why we can trust God. I'm not saying God is playing a utilitarian game. What I'm saying is that God allows free creatures to make their own choices, and he can redeem those choices even when we can't see when or how that redemption comes because we're in this very small window of time and we can see very little. Okay. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you, Cole. Good questions, insightful questions. Yes, sir, what's your name? Hello, my name is Christian. Luke, I am your father. (laughs) You're supposed to say. I have a question. No! Go ahead, go ahead. (laughs) Go ahead, so what's your name? Christian. Christian, go ahead. So what are three key guides you would give on how to be properly humble? You should probably read my new book, 10 Steps to Humility and How I Made It in Seven. (laughs) Which is very humble of me because I actually made it in six. I think the Bible would be number one because especially if you read the Proverbs, Uh, You know, pride comes before the fall. Uh, Nothing really good happens when you think that you've hung the moon. And uh, you also ought to read about how God gives certain people gifts. And there's everybody in this room has a certain gift that can contribute to the kingdom of God. They're not all the same gifts, thankfully. People have different gifts. And it's not, if you're a Christian, it's not your job or my job to save the world. It's just our job to do what we can 
in the overall plan to save the world, and we're all doing just a little piece of it. So I think if you look at the scriptures and you look at what happens when people do get prideful, that should be a corrective for us to say we ought not do that. In fact, the entire book of Judges talks about how a nation or the, na the, tribe of, uh, uh, the tribes of Israel, whenever they got real prosperous, they forgot about God and then he judged them and then they repented and they came back and then they got prosperous again. Then they forgot about God and he judged them. They go in this cycle, right? I think one of the biggest challenges we have in America, Christian, is that I know it's going to sound weird, too much prosperity, too much comfort. Because then we start thinking God wants us to be comfortable all the time. And when we're not comfortable, we think, God, where are you? I mean, there are people in Israel that have been murdered, and we get upset when we have spotty Wi-Fi. Right? We're not demonstrating the proper level of humility. Everything good comes from God, so we need to thank God for every good thing. And even the things that are difficult help us to become more like Jesus if we take them the right way. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Why did you ask that question, by the way? Um, I like thinking about how Jesus acted. Mm -hmm. And I really, want to, I really want to be like him in my life. Mm. We all ought to want to. But when you look at the bar that Jesus set, none of us can accomplish that on our own. We're going to need uh, to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, submit ourselves to accountability, to submit ourselves to other people. In fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace, some of you may know him. He's a cold case homicide detective, and he wrote the book Cold Case Christianity. He's coming out with a new book uh, next year. It has to do with uh, true crime. And he's been doing some research, and he says, you know what the secular research shows about the one quality that you need to have that's going to help you in every area of your life. It's going to help you learn more. It's going to help you in your relationships at home. It's going to help you in your relationships at work. It's going to help you in your relationships with friends. It's going to help you become more and more like Jesus. If there's one quality that you could acquire, that you could work on, that will help you do all those things, it is humility. So you're going down the right road. Keep going. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. All right. <clears throat> Stay right here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I go right here? <laughs> go right here? <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, my name is Calvin. Calvin, go ahead, sir. Yes. Um, Are you predestined I, to be here? Well, my middle name is... <clears throat> yeah. My middle name is Wesley, so you tell me. Oh! So. <laughs> this and man has a fight every day. There you go, yeah. With himself. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, sir. So I graduated from Missouri Western in 2009. I went to Christian Challenge with Paul Damry. Um, so mm -hmm. I've, I've been in St. Joe for about 15 years. I've been a, a pastor for about... 13 years in St. Joe, and I'm a huge apologetics fanboy. I've, I've listened to tons of William Lane Craig, James White, you know, people like that. And so mm -hmm. when I first got into ministry, I was really excited to go out and talk to atheists and talk to Muslims and talk to people who had worked out logical syllogisms for why they believe what they believe. But as I've gotten to know this community I minister in, we have about 76,000 people here, and only about 4,000 people go to church on a Sunday, mm -hmm. which leaves about 72,000 people we don't have a large Catholic population, a large atheist population, a large Hindu population. We really just have about 70,000 people who don't believe anything. They've never really thought about anything. And so when I go to try and have a philosophical conversation, there's, they really haven't even considered you know, these hard questions we're talking about. I understand the marching order of the church is the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. I understand the gospel is the answer. But just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if you talk to someone not who has a well-thought-out reason for why they believe what they believe, but someone who's never even thought about these things, how would you have that conversation? Well, when I strike up conversations with people I don't know, I just, after I introduced myself, I said, hey, where are you from? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you do? And, and see if there's any... Thing they say that I can learn about them that will give me an opening to talk about something deeper. Um, sometimes when they ask me what I do and I tell them, I can tell whether they'd be interested in going further or not. Mm -hmm. 
If I say, hey, I wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, and I go to college campuses, high schools, and churches and present the evidence that Christianity is true, if they look interested, then I may go further. If they go, oh, <laughs> they're not going to be interested. And it's really hard to push a rope, mm -hmm. right? When people aren't interested, it's really hard to push a rope. So you're basically asking the question, what do you do with people who are apathetic, Yeah. right? And our, the president of our seminary, he passed on, but he's a co-author. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, Norman Geiser. One time he was asked a question in seminary. Someone said, what's the greatest problem in America today? Is it ignorance or apathy? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. So what do you do with apathy? Suppose you ask somebody the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And the person hesitates or says no. What do you do with such a person like that? I think there are four things. There's more than four, but here are the four things I think you can do. Number one, you can pray. You should always pray. Mm -hmm. Number two, you can plant seeds every once in a while. If you know that person, you can plant seeds that cause them to question their worldview or give evidence for the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. Number three, you can love them, which means you don't approve of everything they do, but you're always there for them, mm -hmm. right? And then number four, you can wait. Why wait? Because, I don't know, how many people in here would consider themselves Christians in here? Okay, here's the question. Your present level of interest in Jesus, has it always been what it is now? No. Everyone's on a spiritual journey. Everyone is either getting closer to Jesus or further away. And one thing I think we have to stop doing is expect everybody to have the same level of interest that we have. I didn't have the same level of interest that I have now when I was 21. I'm 61 now, right? So when some, say, college student comes up to this microphone, a lot of people will say, well, why don't you get mad at them when they get mad at you? I go, why would I expect a 21-year-old to, 21 to agree with me? Mm -hmm. I didn't agree with me when I was 21. Mm -hmm. So it's like Paul said. We, he said, I was an insolent and arrogant man, but Jesus showed me mercy, showed me, so showed me grace. So I think when we wait, what we're saying is, I understand you might not be interested now. And then what you are going to find out, that since everybody at some point goes through difficulty, maybe even tragedy, when that person goes through tragedy, if they're ever going to be interested in Christianity, your phone is going to ring and that person's going to be on the other end. Mm -hmm. okay. They're not going to call their atheist friend when things go wrong. What's the atheist friend going to say? Well, there's no rhyme or reason to any of this. This stuff just happens. Mm -hmm. No, they're going to call you a person of spiritual depth. When the student's ready, the teacher will be summoned. Mm -hmm. Okay? So just stay in that person's life. And wait, but while you're waiting, pray, plant seeds, and love them. And ask questions like planning, like if Christianity were true, yeah. you become a Christian. Keep, keep inviting them to church. Invite to do book studies with them, that kind of thing. My friend Greg Kokel, who wrote the book Tactics, a great book to help mm -hmm. you interact with people. He likens evangelism much more to gardening than harvesting. Okay? If you think that every time you have a conversation with somebody, if you're a Christian, you've got to get them to the foot of the cross, first of all, most of the time, that's unrealistic. Secondly, it's, it's so daunting, you'll say, I'm not going to do any of it because I'm never going to get there. But if you, think of, if you think of evangelism like gardening, where you're just planting seeds, or to use another analogy, baseball, just get on base, <laughs> right? Don't, you don't have to hit a home run. Just, just get the person to think that truth exists, Right? Then later, maybe God exists, and then maybe miracles are possible, and finally, Jesus rose from the dead. Then suddenly, they're a Christian, mm -hmm. okay? But it wasn't sudden. It took all of that time to take them around the base path. Mm -hmm. just, just get a hit, that's all. Mm -hmm. And then maybe somebody else will bring them to second, third, and finally home, or maybe it'll be you later. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Calvin. Wesley. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Martin. Mark. Go ahead, sir. Martin. Oh, Martin. As in Luther. Martin Luther. Man, we got them all here. <laughs> so, we got Ma Calvin, Wesley, and one guy. He's schizophrenic. And now we've got, <laughs> now we've got Martin Luther here. Okay. 
So I, I have more of a, a moral question, more so than an apologetics question. Okay. And this is something I, I'm just kind of collecting thoughts on right now to try and form my own thoughts about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, how much should Christians interact with government systems and legislative systems? Should we participate inside of democracies? And if so, to what extent should we participate in these democracies? So, like, if we vote for someone, and it turns out this guy's, like, super evil, and he drops a nuke on some innocent Who do you village. have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> well... I will remain silent on that issue for now. Let's say some hypothetical president in the future does this. Mm -hmm. Should we participate in these systems at this risk? And mm -hmm. then also, to what extent should Christians submit to an unjust government? And I'm thinking of someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, it's a great question. And I know there are a lot of Christians that, you know, say, hey, we got to stay out of politics. I, I get the sentiment. We just got to preach the gospel. When I only get one minute with somebody to show them why that's a foolish thing to say, I simply show them this image, and you can pull this right off of Google. Does anyone know what this is? Okay, that's the Korean Peninsula, right? Here's South Korea, the 38th parallel. We fought a war over that. Here's North Korea. South Korea has freedom. They have productivity. They have the gospel. North Korea, on the other hand, is a concentration camp. Concentration camp. There's one major reason for the difference between South and North Korea. What is it? Politics. The South has political freedom. The North does not. And so I'm so frustrated when I hear even pastors say, well, I just preach the gospel. I don't get involved in politics. And I say to them, if you think the gospel is important like I do, you better think politics are important. Why? Because politics affects your ability to preach the gospel. I mean, can you have a first Baptist church in North Korea? <laughs> No, why not? Because politically, they've ruled it out. And some of the countries I've been to, I've been to Iran, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to China. We can't do what we're doing in this room right now in those countries. Why? Because politically, they've ruled it out. So you have to be involved politically if for no other reason to protect your right to preach and live the gospel. Right. Secondly, if you love your neighbor, and that's what Jesus told us to do, you ought to fight to put laws in place that protect your neighbor from evil. Are only atheists qualified to do that? No, we have to do that. And Jesus was involved in politics. In fact, I mentioned earlier, who did he go after the most? The Pharisees, they were the politicians. In fact, he said to them in Matthew 23, 23, he said that you're neglecting the weightier matters of the law. You're tithing your spices, but you're neglecting the weightier matters of the law. You know, we're doing that in this country right now. We're telling people what light bulbs they can and can't use. We're telling people what stoves they can and can't buy. We're telling people what cars they can and can't drive, but we won't say don't mutilate your children. Hmm. Or we won't say don't murder your children. Right. We're majoring in the minors. And you know whose fault it is? It's our fault. Hmm. Because the church hasn't been engaged. We haven't cared hmm. enough to care hmm. for people outside of this, outside of the church. Hmm. And governments are put in place to protect innocent people from evil. That's what good governments do. Mm -hmm. Bad governments do evil. Right. And our government is beginning to do evil. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're not legislating morality anymore. We're legislating immorality. In fact, let me just tell you what's going on very briefly, and then we'll move on. On March 30th, 2022, President Biden came out on Trans Visibility Day, and he talked about how all trans people are made in the image of God, and he's correct about that. Everyone's made in the image of God, but he only quoted half the verse. The second half of the verse said, and he made them male and female. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're so brave to try and transition. That same day, a division of Health and Human Services within his administration put out basically a memo that said, if you as a parent do not affirm your child in so-called gender-affirming care, which means hormone blockers, cross-sex hormones, and eventually surgery, the government may come and take your child from you. Hmm. I'm not making this up. I hope it never comes to this, but I'm telling you that someday someone is gonna get a knock at their door a government official is going to want to take a child from a parent and shots will be fired. And you know why? 
because Christians have been silent. Hmm. Do you know that only half of Christians vote? Do you know that according to David Barton, who tracks all this stuff, what percentage of the people who are voters in America select the president? 18%. When you account for all the people that don't vote, it turns out that 18% of the people select who the president is. And if Christians would just vote biblically, most of the political problems we have would vanish. But we're too afraid. We buy into the idiotic church and state debate. This has nothing to do with church and state. We're not legislating religion. We're legislating morality. We're not telling people where, when, or how, or if to worship. That would be legislating religion. Nobody wants to tell them they have to be a member of a church. But we are telling people how they ought to treat one another, and everybody's doing that. Right. The Biden administration wants to tell parents how to treat their children. So, yeah, we've got to be involved. Okay. And so if we're not, we're not doing our civic duty. And I know a lot of people going, well, voting doesn't matter. There's cheating. There's always cheating. Okay? You just do what's right and leave the results to God. Yeah. Okay? You don't get out of it. You just do what's right, leave the results to God. All right? All right. Thanks Good so question. Much. Thank you, Mark. Hey, what's your name? Uh, my, name's, my name's Izzy. Izzy, go ahead. Uh, I had a question about um, one of your slides said that from an atheist point of view, no one created something out of nothing. Yes. That's just what, what I'm saying to you is what I heard from the from the presentation, mm -hmm. and then the theist point of view was someone made something out of nothing. Yes. But I just got kind of confused because I thought that you said earlier that God was, like, didn't have any matter and yes. was no space, take yes. up, took up no space. Yes. So in my mind, I think, I feel like that would make him nothing. Yeah, I, okay, I get what you're saying. It's a good question, Izzy. You're, you're saying if God isn't physical, then he, he's not real, kind essentially, of. right? Yeah. Okay, but we know a lot of things that aren't physical that are real. Like, for example, your mind isn't physical, but it's real. Your soul isn't physical, but it's real. The laws of logic aren't physical, but they're real. The, law, the times tables aren't physical, but they're real. These are laws, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So there are things that exist that are not physical. Love isn't physical. Justice isn't physical. So these are immaterial things that are grounded in the nature of an immaterial being, God, and that being isn't physical. If he was physical, it would mean he was composed, right, of parts. Mm -hmm. And anything that's composed of parts is put together by a composer, but you can't go on an infinite regress of composers. Actually, you got to get back to an uncomposed composer. Also, if God were physical, it means he would break down because everything physical ultimately does break down, and we know that God can't break down. He is an immaterial, eternal being. So when we look at the creation of the universe and we see space, time, and matter come into existence, that data seems to imply to me anyway that what could have created space, time, and matter before there was any space, time, and matter? Only something that's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. That some call is an unembodied mind. Does that make any sense at all? That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, great question, Izzy. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's your name? Adam. Say again? Adam. Adam, go ahead. Yep. Um, my question is about apologetics and evangelism. Uh -huh. So not necessarily in relationships where you know you'll get to see people again, but just on the street or on the bus or at work or whatever, or works like it. But, you know, uh -huh. spontaneous evangelism. Do you think that this more like evidential, like evidence-based apologetics is good for those conversations or more presuppositional? Like, you know God exists and you know you've offended him, so let me take you to Christ. It's going to depend on the person. I don't think there is a cookie-cutter approach for anyone. 
You know, some people already know there's a God, just some kind of creator, moral being out there, but they don't know about Jesus. If that's the case, then you can just talk about who Jesus was and what he did for you, right? Uh, but if the person doesn't believe in God at all or doesn't even believe in truth, so many people say, oh, wait, that's your truth. I got my truth. You got to start where we started earlier, right? <laughs> So it really depends on what the, where the individual is. And you can start from where the individual is and move forward there. And as I say, it's not always going to be, oh, we're going to have one conversation and you're going to become a Christian. That happens, but rarely. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's like baseball, right? Mm -hmm. We're just getting on base, mm -hmm. trying to move the person around the diamond. I have one quick yeah, follow-up to that then. So, And this is, I'll just confess myself, like uh -huh. I had a conversation earlier this week uh -huh. then where... I was using a more like evidence-based approach. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you know that's true? Yeah. How do you come to these ideas? Um, he, everything was relative to him. And I ended up not sharing the gospel with him mm -hmm. because I was just so, uh, not that I don't think, you know, divinely he could believe it right there, mm -hmm. but more so this guy doesn't have any grasp on reality, on mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. where he gets his claims from. Mm -hmm. Is that what you do with the planting seeds, with sure. the trying or to... Sure, or putting a stone in his shoe. There's different yeah. ways of looking at it, you know? I mean, if he believes in relativism, he thinks all truth is relative, and you say, is that a relative truth? And mm -hmm. you just wait yeah. <laughs> and see what he says, right? He may, he may not admit it right away, but he's going to walk away going, yeah, gee, I kind of defeated myself there. Mm -hmm. How can I say that, right? Yeah. So it's a process. It's rarely a one-time event. And when it is a one-time event, you know what happened? Somebody took that guy around the bases, so he's on third leaning in. And then you were the one to bring him home. Right? Yep. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi, I'm Heather. Thank hey, you. Heather. Um, I'm here with several members of a speech and debate club of kindergarten. No, you're not. 12th grade. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. You're supposed to debate. Come on. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> and I know there's several students in the room. I was wondering if you could share um, what it took to bring you here today from a tactical, what kind of studying, what kind of a classwork, what kind of a, what is your, your background to bring you to this? Oh, uh, okay. well, I was brought up in New Jersey. And so what exit? <laughs> Oh, forget about it. <laughs> right, right in the shadow of Shea Stadium, which no longer throws shadows. It's now City Field. All right. Uh, well, I grew up in New Jersey, so I was Catholic because it's the law. Okay? When you're from New Jersey, either Catholic or Jewish. But I was Catholic. I went to Catholic high school. I always believed in God. I knew there had to be a first cause. I was generally a moral kid. You know, I didn't get into a lot of trouble. Uh, I went off to college and went through RTC, and when I got into the Navy, I met the son of a Methodist minister, and I had so many questions for him, he finally said, look, you just need to get Josh McDowell books, Evidence Demands a Verdict in More Than a Carpenter. So I read those books, and I said, wow, Christianity's true. When I got out of the Navy, I met a man by the name of Norman Geisler, who at the time was the Michael Jordan of apologetics, and uh, he had started a seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. So 30 years ago, 1993, my wife, myself, and three sons moved from the D.C. area down to Charlotte to go to SES. So I learned just about everything I know, at least the basics of it, at Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is still a great place to go, ses.edu forward slash Frank. There's a scholarship you can get if you do that for taking certain apologetic courses. So I came to faith through apologetics. I learned under Dr. Norman Geiser. He was up there a minute ago. Um, I learned under him and other uh, instructors there. Uh, so he, he co-wrote, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And in fact, when he died, they figured out that he had written or co-wrote or updated 129 books. Wow. So he has written more books than most people have seen. <laughs> right in one place uh, and uh, so I learned from him and then since then you have to do a lot of reading on your own right you can't be a leader if you're not a reader right. yeah and I don't even like to read but you have to read and you have to learn from other people because there's only two ways you can, well three ways you can learn through direct revelation or you can learn from your own experience or from the experience of other people and you don't have enough time to learn it all on your own so you have to rely on other people to learn what you really need to know and that's why SES is so good. It gives you a track to run on. Hmm. 
Thank all you. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Heather. Mm -hmm. And you, you're not a debate leader. <laughs> okay. Yes, she is. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes, see? She is. The New York woman. <laughs> she is so. You want a piece of me? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. What's your name? My name is Isaac. Isaac, go ahead. Hold uh, on, Isaac. Clint to the rescue. Yeah. I'm constantly reminded of how short <laughs> I am. He's a debater, too. Uh huh. <laughs> no, he's not. Go ahead, Isaac. Um, so you said earlier that um, choosing, like, being able to be in heaven is a choice because you choose uh, Jesus, which I agree with. So what would you say um, about, like, people who have never even heard, like, third, third world countries that have never even um, been told about um, the gospel or even um, babies who don't uh, have the... Um, mental capacity to understand the gospel? Yeah, that is a great question. What about those that have never heard? So let's take a look at that because uh, it, it comes up a fair amount. Okay, notice this is a moral question because it's implying that if God is all loving, he would get his word to everyone, right? So it's, it's sort of questioning the morality of God, just so we know that off the top. Okay, let's point out that Christ's sacrifice is necessary for salvation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the only way an infinitely just being can allow sinners to go unpunished if, is, is if he punishes an innocent substitute in our place, all right? So first of all, everyone knows that God exists through nature and conscience. Those are the three arguments we went through before. Remember, Isaac? Mm -hmm. Cosmological, teleological, moral. You just know God's invisible qualities are clearly seen, as Paul says in Romans 1, so that we're without excuse. We know there has to be a creator, and he's a moral creator. Secondly, some say that those who don't know Jesus can be saved by Christ's sacrifice if they seek God. Like the Old Testament saints, people in the Old Testament didn't know the name of Jesus, but if they trusted in Yahweh, they were still saved. Okay, however, the more biblically consistent view is that God will get true seekers the truth about Christ so they can be saved. Like, for example, in Acts 10, there was a figure known as Cornelius who believed in Yahweh, but he still needed to know the name of Jesus in order to be saved, okay? So it seems like once Jesus shows up, you have to know the name of Jesus. Finally, it could be that God has so ordered the world so that those who never hear the gospel wouldn't have believed it anyway. And why do I say that? Because Acts 17 says this. In Acts 17, Paul goes to Greece, and he's standing... Uh, right next to the Parthenon on Mars Hill, and he's talking to these pagan, these Greek pagan philosophers, and he says this to them. He says, from one man God made every nation that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. In other words... God has so preordained the world the way the world is that those that do hear the gospel, some of them will accept it, but those that don't hear the gospel wouldn't have believed it anyway. That's just a possibility. We don't know if this is true for sure, but we know this at the end of the day. God wants all people to be saved, right? He wants people to be saved more than we do. And so nobody's going to get to the afterlife and go, God, if I had only known, I would have accepted you. Because God wants them to be saved more than me. This is why we get reports coming out of many Muslim countries now where Jesus is appearing to Muslims in dreams and visions. So many uh, times that some towns have this billboard that says, if you saw the man in the white robe, call this number. <laughs> right? Because people don't know how to interpret it sometimes. Jesus is appearing to these people because they want to be saved. So at the end of the day, nobody is going to be, is going to get a raw deal in, in heaven or hell. Everyone's going to go where they're supposed to go. And uh, what we do, since we know what does save people, is we risk all to get them the gospel. And then we leave any ambiguity to God. He's the one that's going to make sure that everything's going to turn out the way it should. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Thanks, um, I, I have a little bit more. So okay. um, I, I agree with everything you said, um, but let's suppose someone um, who does not believe in God and is trying to um, disprove him, mm -hmm. um, they, and they asked you, um, so if the people who did not hear them uh, did not hear of Christ, um, 
if they went to hell because they were not un- because they were unable to hear him, wouldn't that be morally wrong of Well, first God? of all, someone who doesn't believe in God doesn't have a moral standard to make that judgment. Right? They're stealing a standard from God to argue against him. Um, but secondly, um, you don't go to hell because you haven't accepted Jesus. You go to hell because you've sinned. It would be like saying, um, uh, I died because I didn't go to the doctor. No, I died because I had a disease. Now, maybe I could have prevented dying by going to the doctor and getting a cure, but the reason I died is not because I didn't go to the doctor. The reason I died is because I had a disease. The same is true with Jesus. The reason that you're going to be separated from God is because you've sinned. Now, you can prevent that by going to the great physician, Jesus, who will pay the punishment for you, but the problem is not your unbelief. That's, that is a problem, but it's not the only problem. Your problem is, is that you've sinned elsewhere, okay? Uh, so sin is the real problem. If none of us, in fact, I haven't said this yet tonight, and I normally do. Do you realize that you can get to heaven by being good? Yeah, you can. You just got to be perfect your whole life. Too late for me. How about you? Okay? So all of us are sinners, so we need a Savior, if we don't have a savior, we're going to hell because we're sinners. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, what's your name? My name is my name is Esther. Esther? Yes. You are here for a time such as this. <laughs> Go ahead, Esther. Um, my question was, um, if God if God's outside of time, how does he view time? How does he view time? All at once. He's, he's outside so he can see everything at once as if it's all happening. Um, I know this is hard for us to comprehend because we're inside of time and we can't imagine what it's like to see everything at once. You see, we have knowledge. God is knowledge. He just is. So he's outside of the space-time continuum, we call it, and he can see it all at once. That's why he can know the future. We're inside and we can't see the future. We can hardly remember the past. I don't even know what I did this morning. I forgot. <laughs> Does that make sense, Esther? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Great question. Uh, well, do you think he views it in like a sphere? A sphere? So I, I was telling her in my, my estimation... Uh-huh. We view time as a continuum, some kind of a start, some time of a beginning. Right. You know, our life has a be- starting right. point, 80, 1982, whatever it is, and it'll end at some point where God is outside of time. So he can view it all at once, sort of like a like it's time, sort of like in a contained in a sphere. Yeah, I don't, how he does that, but, I don't know. But but I let don't me know. show you something if I can find it here. I don't know if I still have this in this uh, presentation, but... Um, there was something out of the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy that dealt with this, and I don't know if I still have it in here or not. Uh, no, I do. Oh, yeah, here it is. Check this out. I don't know if this is right because it's, it's heady stuff, but this is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Check this out. The theory of relativity is generally taken to support the idea that the universe is a four-dimension space-time block, that time is a matter of perspective, and that an ideal knower outside the universe would observe it all at once. Now, if you understand that, you're better than I am. Okay, I'm just telling you what's there, okay? So we can envision different ways of doing this, but remember, we're in space and time. We're in this four-dimensional height, depth, width, time continuum and we it's hard for us to imagine what's outside of that just like it would be hard for a a stick figure who is in two dimensions to imagine three dimensions it's just hard for us to imagine great question though thank you thank you thank you esther yes sir hi what's your um, name my name is cole 
Cole. Yep. Two Coles. Uh, with a K, yeah. yeah. Oh, Cole with a K. Different. A little special. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, what is, like, the Christian perspective of, like, balancing um, the love for people and, like, also uh, kind of paternalism when it comes to dealing with um, situations? <laughs> like, for instance, like, a um, situation of, like, homelessness that is, like, rampant, you know? that is caused by, like, drug addiction and mental illness, how do we balance, like, loving that person with also, like, doing what is best for them, even if it's against their will? Yeah, why do you ask that question? Uh, I'm just wondering, like, how you would practically go about solving these problems as a Christian. Well, let's all agree that as Christians, we are concerned about taking care of the poor and people who are less fortunate than Mm -hmm. us. We may disagree on how to do that. In other words, we agree on the end. We may disagree on the means. Mm. And um, Paul says something in, I want to say it's 1st or 2nd Thessalonians. It may sound harsh, but it's probably helpful. When he says, he who doesn't work doesn't eat. Mm -hmm. In other words, we should be urging people, if they're capable, to work and become sufficient self-sufficient by their skills right one of the problems that we've had in this nation ever since lbj in 1965 is we've created an entire welfare class that just waits for their check and that doesn't help them yeah now that's not to say there aren't people that can't Mm -hmm. work and we should do what we can to take care of them but if we're encouraging idleness that's not good for them and it's not good for the nation Right, yeah. I'm not arguing for, like, a nanny state or anything. I'm not a uh-huh. big government guy. I'm wondering, like, how would the church go about helping these well, people? Well, that's one of the problems. The church, in, to a certain extent, has usurped a lot of that to the government, mm-hmm. and that's the problem. We ought to be the ones that are taking care of people. We say, oh, the government will do that. We don't need to do that. Sure. So we have to, I mean, in, in Charlotte, where I live, we have the, uh, the Charlotte Rescue Mission, which we personally donate to because they do that. They try and get people off of drugs and trying to uh, help rehabilitate them so they can go out and be productive members of society. Okay. And they're the ones that are experts at doing that. Mm. Right? It's really hard because, as you know, drug addiction especially can make people completely unreliable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Great question. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Brandon. Brandon, go ahead. Um, so I've read through, I'm not all Let's the way go, through, Brandon. I've read through your Come book <laughs> and, um, you, <laughs> I get that a lot, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you outlined the, your surge evidence in mm-hmm. your book mm-hmm. and the R is the, uh, the cosmic radiation afterglow. Yeah. And you say that that is from the Big Bang. Yeah. And prior to reading your book, I completely disregarded the Big Bang as... Oh happening because it's primarily associated with uh, atheism and explaining it around God. So how do you know that that happened or that that radiation is from the Big Bang? Okay, well, first of all, I know people will try and say that the Big Bang was atheistic when, in fact, the Big Bang was a phrase put on the discovery that the universe had a beginning by... Um, Sir Fred Hoyle, who was an astronomer who wanted to say the universe was static and eternal. So once this evidence came down, he was kind of upset with it, and he said, what are you going to call this theory, the Big Bang? And they went, yeah, yeah, that's good. It, it stuck. And all the Big Bang says is there was a beginning. It doesn't tell you who the beginner was or how it began. It just says that space, time, and matter had a beginning. And one piece of evidence for that is the radiation afterglow, which is the the smoking gun to the Big Bang. In other words, if the universe did begin in a fiery explosion from a single point, you would expect remnant heat out to be out there still, even though it happened according to them 13.8 billion years ago. And they discovered this in 1965 at Bell Labs in Homedale, New Jersey. Uh, By accident, Penzias and Wilson, who were two uh, scientists working there, they discovered it by accident, and by 1978, they were granted Nobel Prizes in physics. 
And an agnostic astronomer by the name of Robert Jastrow said, this has put the nail in the coffin of the last doubting Thomas who thought that the universe was a steady state, that it didn't have a beginning. Now people are saying, yeah, it had a beginning. So it's the remnant heat from the Big Bang explosion. Now this, I think, comports well with creation. And I don't know why people think it's atheistic unless they're coming at it from a perspective of saying, well, the universe is young, so the Big Bang can't be true. I, I guess I've always just associated the words Big Bang with um, atheists saying that it was all the matter was there in that little point that spun and exploded randomly. I guess I've always, always associated it with that, not necessarily that God exploded the universe out of nothing. Yeah, well, it wasn't a point in the sense that there was anything there. It, the, the volume was zero. Mm -hmm. It was actually non-being, and then everything came into existence. And somebody asked me the other night, well, why couldn't God create everything fully formed, just like maybe he created Adam and Eve, you know, of the, like fully formed of age? Well, if God did that, if he just created a universe fully formed, how would we know it was created? Right? Mm -hmm. But when we see a universe expanding that continues to expand, we know there was a creation point. So it's actually evidence that God created the universe. The only question is, what kind of being could have created space, matter, and time? And I think another thing you need to be aware of is that there's a difference between the Big Bang theory and the evidence for the Big Bang. The Big Bang theory might be, well, the universe had a beginning, we don't know how it happened. The evidence for the Big Bang is the universe had a beginning, and if space, matter, and time had a beginning, what I'm saying and others are saying is it's got to be a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator. All right? That answers my questions. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, hey, what's your name? Uh, my name is Caden. Caden, go ahead. Um, so I have a few questions. The first one is, um, could you maybe define you, um, utilitarian a little bit better? Well, utilitarian would do the most good for the most people. And the problem is a utilitarian has to assume a moral standard as to what is good, right? Mm -hmm. And we can think of scenarios where doing the most good to the most people isn't the right thing to do. Like, for example, it might bring joy to a group of people to torture somebody they wanted tortured, like Jesus. It's going to bring a lot of joy to all the, the people out there who wanted Jesus dead. Should, should we torture him because of that? No. So you don't torture or kill somebody to quell an angry mob. It might be utilitarian to do so, but that's not the right thing to do. So you're saying utilitarian is more based off majority and not morality? Well, it's, it's smuggling a moral law in mm -hmm. because it's, 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 it's deciding what is good. Well, how do you know what good is unless there's a moral law that tells you what good is? All right. Mm -hmm. And then it's trying to do some calculation to try and figure out who's going to get the, uh, can we maximize the amount of benefit? that comes from doing X, Y, or Z. Whichever brings the max benefit, that's what we should do. Those are all moral principles. We should do them. Why? Who said? And how do you even calculate that? You know, what, what kind of happiness calculator do you have that says you ought to do this and not this? So, no, I don't think, I think it's a system that doesn't work ultimately and has to steal from God to actually get off the ground. So, would you say that our government could start be leading towards utilitarian? Well, Americans are pretty much pragmatists, which means we'll do whatever that works. Why do people abort their children, their own children? Well, kids are inconvenient. It's going to get in the way of my career. I don't have time right now. I've got other things to do. It's going to, it's going to bog me down. Kids are expensive. It's all pragmatic stuff. It's inconvenience in me. So, yeah, unfortunately, we're, we don't... We're not following the moral law. We're just following whatever is going to make us happy, okay. comfortable. And then my uh, next question is, um, you've basically said how atheists uh, believe in some sort of a miracle. Mm -hmm. But what about people who consider themselves anti-supernaturalists? Where do they get their theories from, and where do they get this so-called evidence that they strive from? Well, probably the most famous anti-supernaturalist in history was David Hume. And David Hume, who died in 1776, was an Enlightenment atheist, one of the few atheists, maybe the only true atheist in the Enlightenment. And he said the reason we can't believe in miracles, essentially, is because the evidence for the regular is always greater than that for the rare. Uh, because uh, 
And since miracles are rare, you ought not believe in rare things. You should only believe in regular things. Now, the problem with that is you can give several counterexamples where the evidence for the rare is good evidence and you ought to believe it. For example, we just talked about it, the Big Bang. The Big Bang only happened once. It's not the Big Bang, 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 Bang theory, right? You can't go back and repeat it. It's a rare event, but there's good evidence it existed. It happened. Uh, the creation of life out of non-life happened somehow. We can't witness it again, but we all believe it happened, right? Uh, the entire history of the world only happened once, and yet we have good evidence to believe it. So there's a lot of rare things that happen that we have evidence to believe. And one of the problems with Hume is he defines a miracle as a rare event, which it is, but then he punishes it for being a rare event. If miracles were regular, we wouldn't consider them miracles. We say this stuff happens all the time. So Hume's argument doesn't work. There's other reasons it doesn't work either. It's actually a circular argument. Um, and that's why we cover it in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. He's probably the most famous person to argue against the supernatural in history. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, what's your name? My name's Ethan. Ethan, go ahead. Uh, so I am attempting to build a sermon on uh, the Armor of God passage. Uh -huh. uh, and I was just wondering if you had any... Um, Oh, I have lost the word. Insight onto, um, thank you, insight onto um, resources that I could use to dive into the passage so that way I can give a good biblical sermon and not accidentally lead anyone astray. Ethan, why do you need me? You're enough. He's wearing a sweatshirt that says yeah. you are enough. So. <laughs> uh, have you ever gone to Blue Letter Bible? I have not. Okay. You like Blue Letter Bible? Somebody. Okay, good. Thank you. Go to Blue Letter Bible. It's a free online website that has commentaries on the whole Bible, including that passage, that will guide you through um, ways uh, to interpret the passage properly and apply it. If you're a real student of the Bible and you really want to go deep, the best software you can get is called Logos Bible Software, L-O-G-O-S. It's several hundred dollars, but it's worth it. I've had it for 25 years. And you can do all sorts of searches. You can drill down on any passage. You can get uh, Treasury of Scripture knowledge, cross-references. You get all sorts of books that come with the level that you buy. It's well worth checking into. So that's what I would recommend you do. Okay, thank you. All right, great question, Ethan. Thank you. Yes, hi, what's your name? Uh, Anna. Anna, go ahead. Um, so this can, uh, it's not considered in the church like a critical, uh, like, part of being a Christian, um, but it can be, uh, like, viewed differently. Some people have different beliefs in the church, like different denominations. Yes. Um, I was curious what I... I I guess, uh, what's your view on women in leadership roles in the church? We're about out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think so, Clint? There's two major views among people that, um, that really believe the Bible's true. There's something called the egalitarian view, which is functionally women can do anything that men can do within the church. And then there's the complementarian view, which says that men and women, while equal in the eyes of God, uh, have different roles in the church. I take the complement complementarian view because I think that's what the scripture teaches. And uh, Kathy Keller, who was the wife of Tim Keller, who passed away, as you may know, earlier this year. K uh, Tim was a brilliant uh, teacher. I didn't agree with everything he said politically, but he was a brilliant Bible teacher. And Kathy Keller said that all this is grounded in the Trinity, if you think about it, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all equally God, but they have different functions. And the Son gives way to the Father on certain issues. Although he's equal to the Father in office, he has a subordinate role in terms of certain functions he carries out. He follows the lead of the Father. 
And so Kathy says, if there's any woman that thinks that she can't submit to the leadership of a man within a church, then she's saying she can't be like Jesus. Now, this goes so far as the man is giving tr proper moral leadership. It's the same thing true in the home. A woman should not obey her husband if the husband is immoral or telling her to do something that's immoral or against what the Bible says. But, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, in a party of two, if there's a disagreement, there can be no majority. Someone has to make the decision. And that falls on the man. It also falls on the man to sacrifice himself for his wife. It's not called for the wife to sacrifice herself for her father, or for her, her husband, I mean. So the man has the bigger responsibility, but also the bigger sacrifice. And Tim Keller said in his marriage, he can only remember one time where he and Kathy didn't agree and he had to make the call. And that was actually the call to go to New York City. And I can think on maybe two occasions, my wife and I disagreed and I had to make the call. Most of the time you work it out and you come to an agreement. <laughs> but I think in the church, God wants the man to be the senior pastor. Yeah. But then woman... Uh, uh, women can have other roles in the church as long as they come under the authority of that leader. Okay. All right. Um, so kind of like a side question uh -huh. with that. Um, so. Oh, by the way, one other thing. There's a, a friend of mine called, uh, his name is Mike Winger, and he, he does Bible Thinker uh, YouTube channel. And I think Mike's video on women in the church is like five hours long or something. I mean, he goes through every passage inside and out. So if you really want to get into this, go there. I know right, what sorry, I'm doing tonight. What's that? I said, I know what I'm doing tonight. Yeah, there you uh, go. No. All right. <laughs> uh, um, so if a woman is called to, like, a leadership role in the church, mm -hmm. not, like, you know, what we just talked about, but, um, and say, like, and her husband isn't, mm -hmm. is, like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. We so. all have different gifts. Not every yeah. couple is going to have equal gifts, right? Yeah. In the church. So a woman might be in a leadership role in the church, still under the authority of a senior pastor, where her husband is not as involved in the church for whatever reason. That can still happen. Would it be better if the man found a way to serve in the church? Of course. But if he can't for whatever reason, okay, the woman can still serve. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how to word that question. So. Okay. Okay. All well, right. I guess I'm done. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yep. Hey, what's your name? Tobiah. Say again? Tobiah. Tobiah, go ahead. No, Tobiah. Oh, Tobiah, sorry. T-O-B-I-A-H. Got it. Um, so we were made with free will. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't we have been made with free will to where we're, we're still making our own choices but not sin? Like, why, why couldn't he have given us, like, a little bit more, like, what, restraint? Or he created everything. Why couldn't he have made, gotten rid of the tree? Why couldn't he have made it to where we will live with him and want to and it still be free will? Okay, you're asking some speculative questions and I can only give you speculative answers, mm -hmm. right? But I will say this, I'm glad the tree was there. Why? Because if the tree wasn't there and we never had an opportunity to make a choice, then this would not be a moral universe. So God gives us free will to make a choice to either follow him, love him, or reject him. The free choice gives us the capacity to make moral choices and also to love, but it also gives us the capacity to do evil. And there's one thing that God can't do regarding this scenario is he can't force free creatures to do what he wants because then they wouldn't be free. Now, the question you ask is a question I've thought about and I don't quite know the answer to is, could God have made us with, say, less of a sin nature, right? That's a good question. I don't know. It's speculative. Um, and there's no way of knowing. But the nature that we do have is bent towards sin. And... Once Adam and Eve sinned and we inherited the sin nature, we're all inevitably going to sin. That's why Jesus had to come to save us all. But he can't force free creatures to do what he wants. It's logically possible that God could create a universe 
where everybody believes and nobody sins, but it's probably not actually achievable with free creatures. Because any universe God creates of enough free creatures, some of them are going to fall. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Hey, what's the matter? You can't stay for six hours? <laughs> Gee, where's your commitment? <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. My, my name is Liliana. Hey, Liliana. That's my daughter-in-law's name. Really? Yes. Great name. Um, Go ahead. If a baby passes away in the womb before it no learns about God, does it go to hell? Why do you ask that question, Liliana? I have no clue. I just wanted to know. Just, okay, just an, a thought you had, okay. What we know from Scripture is that since God is love and wants all people to be saved, you would imagine that any baby or anybody before the age of what we call accountability that died would be taken to heaven. Now, do we have anything in the Bible that would suggest that? Yes. When David's son died, prior to him dying, David was mourning and praying. And when the son died, David got up, he's the king of Israel, and he went about his business. And his servants came to him and said, King, you were mourning when the baby was sick. Now that the baby has died, you seem to be okay. Why? And David said, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. What's the implication? The implication is, is that David will go see his son in heaven after he passes on. He knew the baby wouldn't come back, but he would go to the baby. So the answer is, I would think, yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you. Hey, um, you both can't be enough. Oh, he took his off, gave it to me. He what? We're just twinning today. You're twinning today. We called each other up before we came in. Okay, you are enough. You know that's like a progressive Christianity phrase? Oh, well. You are enough? As long as they are uh, following the right enough. I don't know. Well, actually, wear, I want you to wear that sweater in two weeks when Elisa Childers comes. Okay, sounds great. Okay. And, and just say, Elisa, I've read everything you've done. You're just so wonderful. How do you like my sweatshirt? See what she says. Okay. Sounds great. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so I have kind of two different matters that are not uh -huh. related to each other at all, uh -huh. but they're just things that have been kind of on the back of my mind for as long as I can remember. So right. I'll address one, let you decide if I address the other. Um, the first one is all about how we believe, obviously our, our biblical foundation is on the Bible. That's mm -hmm. in the name. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe it's God inspired, but how do we overlook the fact that you know, we're looking at quotes and scriptures from Paul, who was a murderer, or we're looking at scriptures from David, who was an adulterer, and we like to say, oh, we'll go get our advice from the wisest man on earth, and with Proverbs 7 specifically, is the one I'll use as an example, is it's Solomon's warning to stay away from an immoral woman, and yet whenever I read later, it's, oh, Solomon, you had 300 wives, 700 concubines that led you astray to worship idolatry before the end. It's a mistranslation. He had 700 okay. porcupines. Oh. <laughs> I still feel like that might be a problem. But basically, I want to ask, how can we see the word of the Lord while looking beyond the sinful nature of man? Like, how can, It'd be like you giving this presentation and then immediately professing, I actually believe in Allah. I'm a Muslim. Like, that makes this carry less weight, even though it's true. Okay, th here's the problem. Uh, it seems like what you're saying is the objection is we can't trust what people say because they're just men and they're sinful. Fair? Yes. Okay. Why should I trust what you just said then? Uh, because you're just a man and you're sinful. This is true. Yeah. See, the problem is, it's really what we call in logic a genetic fallacy. To say that because the source of a statement might be immoral, that you can't trust what the person says. 
you don't evaluate whether somebody is telling you the truth merely by their reputation. That might go into you judging it, but they may be telling you the truth. So you can't just dismiss what somebody says because they're, they're a sinner. We're all sinners. And if we can't trust what sinners say, we can't trust what anyone says, including what I just said. Do you see the problem? It's self-defeating. I do. Okay. So what you need to do is evaluate what people say to see if it has any merit. Now, if you notice, the biblical characters uh, that God chooses are all weak, flawed people like the rest of us. Okay? I mean, why does, he p why does he pick David? Yeah, David has great qualities, but as you mentioned, he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then, right? Why does he pick Peter? Peter says, you know, Lord, I'll never deny you. You know, a little bit later, he denies him three times, right? Well, he can work, he can work through imperfect people. He picks Paul, which actually is a great move because before Paul was a persecutor of the church, he was a dictatorial, dogmatic, defiant doer. After he became a Christian, he was a dictatorial, dogmatic, defiant doer in the other direction. He used that personality and turned it toward a good direction. So God, the only perfect person in the history of the world is Jesus. Everybody else, God can use, and God gives us the dignity of causality, as Pascal put it, that you can affect time and eternity by what you do every day. You know, God doesn't need us to evangelize. He could evangelize everybody directly if he wanted to, but he allows us the dignity of causality to give us the pleasure of the responsibility of actually affecting time and eternity. So we just can't throw this stuff out because people are sinners. We're all sinners. We have to look at what they said to see if it's really true. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Would you like to hear the second one? Or do I can just quickly because we got two more behind you and then we got to okay. go. Go ahead. I'll make it quick. Um, the second one False. is... Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> the second yeah, one ahead. is based on the fact that we have this moral theory that's based all on the fact that we have a perfectly moral God. Mm -hmm. And yet we also agree that the murdering of the innocent, specifically of, you know, children and babies. Mm -hmm. um, I understand they're born into a broken world, mm -hmm. but uh, we still morally agree that murder is wrong. Mm -hmm. But how do we overlook that morality whenever the order comes from God to say, oh, and now it's morally fine for you to go into these countries, murder the women, murder the babies? Because based on the Passover, where he goes in to the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. goes in and murders the firstborn, that's, to me, it's saying, well... All right, let me stop right there before you... Great. I know where you're going with this, okay? Let me ask you a question. When God kills somebody, is it murder for God? I mean, I understand that he can do whatever he would like. Right. It's murder for us because we're, we're not the creator and resurrector of life. God is the creator and resurrector of life. He owns life. He can take life whenever he wants. And we have videos on this on our YouTube channel, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the entire answer here, but let me just say this, a couple of things. Number one, that is when God orders people killed in the Old Testament, he has the authority to do that, just like he has the authority right now if he were to pull his hand away from any of us and we were to die. Because people don't really die, they just change location. If Christianity's true... People don't die, they just change location. Secondly, if you look at the Old Testament passages about, mur you know, wipe everybody out, the women, the children, and all this, like go to Deuteronomy 7. It'll say, wipe everybody out, the very next verse it says, and then don't intermarry with them. And you're going, wait a minute. How could you intermarry with every, any, anybody you just wiped out? Dr. Paul Copan, who wrote two big books on this topic, we just had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, one is called, Is God a Moral Monster? And the other is called, Is God a Vindictive Bully? Points out that the language used in the Old Testament is ancient Near East or hyperbole language, which was used to say, wipe these people out, not completely exterminate them, but push them out of the land, uh, defeat them thoroughly. 
It doesn't literally mean to kill everybody, but even if it does mean to kill everybody, God can do that because he is God. And in fact, we just did a podcast on this just two weeks ago. Let me ask you a question. If you have a group of people intent on murdering you, what are your options? To die or to run. To die or what? To run. Die, run, or defend yourself. Those are pretty much the three, right? Right now, um, do you think Hamas is going to live peacefully next to Jews? No. No. What possible response do the Jews have? The same three you just mentioned. They can die, run, or defend themselves. Now, there were tribes almost like Hamas in the Old Testament. They're called the Amalekites and other Canaanite tribes. They wanted the Israelites dead. What's God's choice? In fact, the Amalekites were were sacrificing their children to Molech, and even Israel fell into this. God has three choices for the Israelites. That is run, kill them, or drive them out because they had to get into the land. So, depending on how you interpret those passages, he either drove them out or he killed them or both. And that's the same position Israel's in right now. Does that give you some perspective? Yes. Okay. So, get those two books because they go into a lot more detail than what we can talk about here. All right? All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ethan. Hello, what was your name again? I can't, I'm enough. That's my name. I don't know. <laughs> I'm enough. Okay, my question is, um, how do you know as a Christian if you're doing too much, if too much is a thing? Why do you ask that? Um, okay, so I, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> sounds prideful. But I, I, I do, I play piano for three different worship bands. I help out at youth group. I lead my own Bible study. I teach a Sunday school class. I try to do my discipleship and whatnot. How do I know if I'm doing too much? Slacker. (laughs) Well, if you don't have time for other things you need to do in life, like bathe, (laughs) eat, (laughs) Mm -hmm. have relationships with other people, do quiet time, you know, study, those kind of things. If you don't have time to do that, then you're going to have to pull back. Look, Jesus went away to pray. Jesus got away from crowds. Jesus himself needed downtime. So we need downtime, too. If you have no downtime, you're going to have to pull back on something. Okay. All and right? then a follow-up question is, yeah. like, how you would ask I... too many questions, too, see? <laughs> how would I <laughs> rank, ahead. like, if I do decide that I'm doing too much or I don't have enough for my quiet time, how do I rank what I should stop doing? Well, you're going to have to do that internally and maybe ask other people what they think is most important. Where are you doing the most for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. right and see what people say and then maybe you'll figure out what you can you can uh drop off and one way you can do this with people is you can say this instead of saying look i can't do this anymore what you can say to them is in order for me to keep my other commitments i have to let some of this go Mm -hmm. all right now no one's going to argue with that if you say it that way i have other commitments and so i can't do everything so you might want to try that. Awesome. All Thank right. you, Dr. Turner. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi. My name is Elaine. Hey, Elaine. Um, I have a question. My friend um, a couple years ago asked me this question, and at the time I didn't know how to answer it. And afterwards I had struggled with it for a little while. Mm-hmm. And um, I had gone to several pastors in my life, Um, and ask them this question, and I did get answers from them, but I never really got an answer that quite satisfied me, I guess you could say. Um, And my question is, um, does God or can God forgive, um, like, suicide? Because I know that suicide is a sin, but can or does God forgive that? Why do you ask that question? Um, like I said, my friend asked me this question, um, and afterwards, like, I had struggled with it for a while. You struggled with the thought of suicide or the thought of how to answer that question? How to answer the question. Okay. 
Because whenever people ask a question about suicide, you always want to say, why are you asking that? Because I had a friend die of suicide. And you don't want to give people justification because suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yes. So let me say this. Um, the manner of your death does not determine your destiny in eternity. What determines your destiny in eternity is, w is whether you've been forgiven because you've accepted what Christ has done or not. However, those that do commit suicide and are Christians are going to have lost rewards because there is a judgment of rewards. And so while they may make it to heaven, they are going to lose certain rewards that otherwise they may have had. So it is a sin. It's not a sin that can't be forgiven. It's just a sin that can't be repented of. So I would try and get somebody who's asking me those questions some help and uh, get a pastor involved. Uh, you could go back and listen to a podcast I did with uh, Pastor John Mark Catan, who is the pastor of Cottonwood Creek Baptist Church in Allen, Texas, near Dallas. He wrote a book called Final Call because he was talking to his brother. He was trying to talk his brother off the ledge, basically. And uh, he, his brother convinced him he was fine. And the next day he was going to drive to Houston to see his brother, and his brother shot himself that night. And so the book Final Call might be helpful to you. Uh, but it's a serious issue, and you want to come around anybody that asks it and make sure that they get the kind of counseling and advice they need because it could happen to any one of us. If we get into an emotional low, it could happen to anyone. So you need to come around people who are struggling with that to lift them up. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Folks, thanks for being here. I want to tell people out there in Internet land, Lord willing, on Thursday night this week, two nights from tonight, we'll be at Auburn University for War Eagle. And then next week, University of Cincinnati, November 2nd. But thanks, everyone, who stayed for however long we did this thing for. And uh, I have a few books. If anybody wants a book, I'll be over at the book table. Thanks for being here, folks. See you next time. <laughs>